Okay. Welcome to folks that are hopping on the line. The Exploring the Feasibility of Offshore Wind Energy for the California North Coast webinar, hosted by the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University, in partnership with the California Ocean Protection Council, will begin momentarily. We are glad you are here with us today, and if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please email windstudies at shotcenter.org or send a message via the chat, and we'll be happy to help you. You should also see this information on the screen in front of you if you are viewing the screen share. We've muted the lines to minimize background noise, and we encourage you to complete the poll that's shown on your screen so we can get to know who is joining us for today's webinar. So thank you and hang tight. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for hopping on. Welcome. My name is Sarah Shen with Strategic Earth Consulting. And on behalf of the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University, thank you all for joining us to be here for the first in a series of five webinars on the topic of offshore wind energy for the California North Coast. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be made available on the Schatz Center website for those who are unable to attend today's meeting. Some of you may be aware that this webinar series was originally intended to be an in-person workshop held last spring, and it was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The SHOT Center, with the support of the California Ocean Protection Council, has been working hard to redesign that workshop into a series of webinars to engage with the broader North Coast community and others interested in the topic of renewable energy. We all want to stay informed and stay safe. So today, they're excited to embark on these community discussions with you and continue the conversation through the next several weeks. That being said, we can't ignore the other challenges that are facing our North Coast community currently, including the ongoing fires. We're thinking of all of you and your safety, and we want to thank you again for creating space in the face of a pandemic, wildfires, homeschooling, social justice reform, and all of the things to be here today. It really means a lot to us. Before reviewing the agenda and the webinar design, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, such as you're unable to see the screen share or use the Q&A or the chat, please email us at windstudies at shotcenter.org or send a message via the chat and we'd be happy to help you. We do have everyone muted on the line in an effort to minimize background noise and we will keep folks on mute until a community discussion. Just wanted to have to send a reminder that if you are seeing your phone number show up under your image, um, we encourage you to rename that so that we can see your name and it'll make it easier for, for us to call on you during the discussion. So as a first step um, for today's webinar, we again would love to invite you to complete the poll that's shown here, where do you live or work, so that we can get a feel for the balance of our local and non-local community members that have joined us today. Also wanted to acknowledge that closed captioning is available. You need to click on the CC button on the bottom of your screen to enable that, and then you should be able to see the closed captions. So while you're populating your responses, I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Arnie Jacobson, Director of the Short Center, to continue with the introduction. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, in this series of five webinars on the feasibility of offshore wind on California's north coast. 
As Sarah noted, my name is Arnie Jacobson, and I'm director of the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. Uh, for the past 18 months, our team and partners have carried out a multidisciplinary study to examine various aspects of offshore wind feasibility. Our work has been supported with funding from the Ocean Prote Protection Council of the California Natural Resources Agency, uh, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric also contributed by providing self-funded funded analysis to the effort, and we are grateful um, uh, for all of this uh, support. Um, so offshore wind has great potential to play a role in addressing climate change. It is a renewable energy technology with a daily and seasonal generation profile that complements other clean energy sources such as solar power. Here on the North Coast, we have the best offshore wind resource in the continental United States. Uh, developing this resource provides an opportunity to generate a significant amount of clean power while contributing to economic development and job creation in our region. It also offers an opportunity to innovate uh, as uh, we uh, could be in a position to develop the first offshore wind farm anywhere on the Pacific coast of the Americas. Uh, so this uh, is an exciting and important opportunity. At the same time, there are a number of barriers and challenges that have to be considered. Issues such as economic viability, transmission and port infrastructure needs, environmental and cultural resource impacts, uh, geologic hazards and conflicts with existing activities have to be examined and addressed if offshore wind is to become a reality in this region. Our team's research was designed to provide information to help a variety of interested parties to consider the opportunity along with the challenges and barriers. I wanna emphasize that our objective has been to provide reliable, unbiased information about the feasibility of offshore wind development. We have carried out this work without ties to commercial or private interest related to offshore wind development. And while we are very strong proponents of the need to identify and implement solutions to climate change, our work on this set of projects does not represent advocacy for offshore wind development. Rather, our goal is to present rigorous analysis that contributes to better understandings of the possibility of developing offshore wind in our region and the pros and cons of such an endeavor. The upcoming series of five webinars is therefore uh, an opportunity to review and discuss our main findings, their implications, and possible next steps. I hope that you find that the information is interesting and useful. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Karen Douglas, California Energy Commissioner. Commissioner Douglas has played an instrumental role in California's efforts to scale up the use of clean and renewable energy, and it's an honor to have her make remarks to inaugurate our webinar series. So I'll pass it over to you now, uh, Karen. Hi, Arnie. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to help kick off this webinar series. And I really want to thank Arnie Jacobson. Sarah, are you, um, sorry, I just want to flag that, Karen, it doesn't seem like you're coming through. I just want to make sure that I'm not the only person having that experience. I'm not hearing her either. This is nice. Karen, it looks, looks like, like you're back. back. Yep. Am I Great. back? Can you hear me now? Yes. If you don't mind All starting right. again, sorry Please about that. start again. I will start again. If it gets too choppy, we just lost internet here. And so I'm on my cell connection and, and uh, making the best of it. So hopefully this works out. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Arnie Jacobson and his team at the Schatz Energy Research Center for inviting me to kick off this webinar series. I'm the lead for the state of California to the Bomb California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. And I've been very involved as have uh, others on this call in uh, the efforts that the state with its partners has undergone over the last couple of years to assess offshore wind energy as a potential clean energy resource um, for the state of California. California has aggressive clean energy goals and without a doubt, the devastation we're currently seeing from wildfires which have been exacerbated by climate change up and down the entire west coast of the United States is just another moment that underscores the need for continued determined action on climate change. 
Um, it's very clear that California needs to scale up renewable energy development. It's also clear to us that California will need a diverse portfolio of resources to do that. And offshore wind can help play an important role in helping us meet our goals, in helping to diversify the state's renewable energy portfolio and helping to complement solar energy production. The North Coast of California has some of the best resources in the state. It's also the most challenging Karen, it seems like we've lost you again. And just if to you can still hear me, it may be helpful to turn off your video to increase your bandwidth. Go ahead, Kelly. Brilliant, Sarah. Apologies, I, I will pause over here. Thanks for your patience with me. Sure, wind resources in the state. It's very challenging from a transmission perspective. And of course, that's what this some that's what this work is about. And and so we greatly appreciate the support from the Ocean Protection Council, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research in Boehm for making this feasibility analysis possible. The North Coast offshore wind feasibility work is a really important step to advancing our understanding of offshore wind and it can also help contribute to the statewide planning work that is underway. This study will identify issues, it'll identify challenges, and we hope it'll help us provide a vision and a roadmap for how we go forward. So with that, I wanna thank our partners for all their collaboration. I'm really looking forward to um, following these webinars and, and learning more. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Arnie, and thank you, Karen. So now we'd like to invite Nessie to give her opening remarks, please. Great. And Nessie Sumate is Chief of Renewable Energy for the Pacific Region of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so on behalf of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, I want to thank the Schatz Renewable Energy Research Center for inviting me to provide some brief remarks to commence the Center's Offshore Wind Webinar Series. Um, so, so my name is Nessie Smyatt and I am the Boehm Pacific Region Renewable Energy Section Chief responsible for managing the offshore renewable energy activities in federal waters of the U.S. West Coast and Hawaii. Many of you know Boehm to be the bureau within the Department of the Interior that oversees the environmentally and economically responsible development of our energy and mineral resources on, the out, on our nation's outer continental shelf. These responsibilities include overseeing the development of renewable energy resources, primarily offshore wind. And we consider public input to be a critical component for a safe and responsible offshore resource management. Throughout our process, we engage and solicit comments from a host of stakeholders and ocean users, including the fishing community, mariners, and coastal communities. All of our activities are underlain by our robust environmental studies program, which ensures that we develop and use the best available science in our decision making. A big part of our data gathering and research effort is through partnering with other government agencies, academia, and non-governmental organizations. We're seeing all the demand for offshore wind energy continues to grow. Technology advances, falling costs, and tremendous economic potential make offshore wind a promising avenue for diversifying and balancing California's energy portfolio. Here in California, BOEM appreciates working closely with the state, particularly the California Energy Commission and the Ocean Protection Council to explore opportunities for offshore wind development. To date, BOEM has determined that there is competitive interest in commercial leasing for offshore wind development offshore California. So jointly with the state, BOEM has identified three areas that may be suitable for future offshore wind leasing activities. Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon on the Central Coast and Humboldt Call area on the North Coast. The next step in the BOEM leasing process is to identify wind energy areas for environmental reviews for potential leasing. Meanwhile, the BOEM and the state will continue to coordinate outreach, gather data, and identify research needs throughout the process. BOEM is also supporting work to help address the challenges to offshore wind development. For example, 
We are funding a state-of-the-art offshore wind resource modeling methodology by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to improve the understanding of model data. In collaboration with our partners at the Department of Energy and the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, BOEM is funding the collection of site-specific meteorological data through the deployment of lighter buoys off Central and Northern California. This data will be used to inform leasing decisions and help to ground truth previously modeled data. BOEM is also working to help facilitate the California Public Utilities Commission's consideration of offshore wind in California's energy resource portfolio planning through work conducted by NREL. And as you will hear in the webinar series, BOEM and the state are working collaboratively on exploring ways of unlocking offshore wind potential in Northern California. BOEM is very glad to be a partner with the Schatz Center and the state of California as we study the feasibility of offshore wind off Northern California. We are grateful to have the local expertise and the talent at the Schatz Research Center to provide, provide all of us with solid research and data that will help guide our future offshore wind planning efforts in the Humboldt area. And I'm pleased to announce that BOEM has just authorized additional funds to continue the work that the Schatz Center has completed pertaining to transmission to incorporate the most recent wind resource data and to study the potential to optimize grid integration of small commercial scale offshore wind projects with a goal of identifying possibilities to reduce transmission costs. BOEM remains committed to partnering with California to ensure the success of any future offshore wind activities, protecting our oceans and coasts and the communities that depend upon them and drawing on the best available science are vanguards of BOEM's leasing decisions. Continuing active engagement and productive conversations between all stakeholders will be critical to moving California into the offshore wind market in a responsible way. So I wanna thank, thank you again, especially Arnie Jacobson, and I look forward to the upcoming series of webinars on offshore wind. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nessie. I'm going to come over here and screen share. And we will now move into um, understanding the layout of today's webinar. Looks like I'm having some trouble screen sharing. Maya, would you be able to screen share slide three? I think I can do that on this end, Sarah, just if that's helpful. Let me make my way over there. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. Of course. So just bear with me, everyone, as we, I get myself a little organized and you need me on slide three. Fabulous. Let me present that. Perfect. Thank you. For what it's worth, the uh, share button just ungrade itself on my end as well, too. <laughs> Fantastic. Love the timing. Okay, so you've heard my voice um, and seen my face a couple of times now. So again, my name is Sarah Shen. Um, I do have with me my colleagues, Kelly Faith, who you just heard speaking and supporting me, Rochelle Fisher and Carolyn Kraft. And Strategic Earth has been contracted by the SHOT Center to help design and facilitate this webinar series. And we may tag team together um, to help guide you through this. And thank you in advance. This is the first time we're doing this all together. So thank you for your patience if we um, run into any technical difficulties or just need some added support. We will also be helping to lead the development of a webinar summary report that will come out following the end of the five series that will be made available to the public and included on the SHOTS, Energy, um, Shots Research Energy Center's website. So it's important to say that as neutral facilitators, we're committed to upholding an inclusive, transparent, and productive dialogue. And if you have any questions or concerns about how we're supporting our neutrality and supporting this conversation in a way that feels comfortable for you, please contact, contact us directly. Our email is hello at strategicearth.com. And we will drop that into the chat in just a moment. 
So now to get to know who is here, um, it would be fantastic, Maya, if you were able to pull up the poll results so we can see who has joined us for today's webinar. Fantastic. Thank you. So the question was, where do you live or work? And it looks like the vast majority of folks, 48, well, just shy of majority, I'm sorry, um, are from the California North Coast, so from Humboldt and Del Norte. So welcome. We also have 31% of attendees from California outside of these regions, 20% from outside of California and still in the U.S., and 1% international. Fantastic. So we look forward to hearing um, a mix of all of these voices and perspectives throughout the webinar today. And welcome again. Okay, so we can move to the next slide, please. I suppose, Kelly, if you're comfortable since you're sharing. Thank you so much. Okay, so as we've mentioned um, a couple of times now, you know, if you are having any te technical difficulties, calling in or viewing the screen share, please email windstudies at shotcenter.org or send a message via the chat. We've mentioned that the webinar is being recorded, transcribed, and closed captioned. Again, you can click the CC if you'd like to see the closed captioning. Um, all participants are muted, and the phone participants, if you are not viewing the webinar, you are in a listen-only mode. Questions can be submitted throughout today's discussion via the Q&A box, which you've seen, or again, emails to the same um, email address, windstudies.shotcenter.com. And when we move later in the agenda to the community discussion, there'll also be the opportunity to use the raise hand function. Um, so you can click the raise hand, and then we will start a verbal queue on our end to line up names, and then we'll come to you um, for your question, and you can make that verbally. So during the community discussion, there will be a combination of um, questions taken from the Q&A, the email, and then using the raise hand function. Um, this webinar is designed to promote active participation. And so there's a number of tools that we have developed in order to do so. So one being the poll, and then secondly being these Q&A and other op opportunities. Um, to help ensure that we, rec um, that we complete today's webinar at 5 p.m., we understand that we might not be able to address all of the questions that we receive. And so we wanted to let you know that we will consider all questions and record these. Um, we will be pr pr producing, publishing a FAQ document, a frequently asked questions document at the end of the series that will consider the, the questions that we received. During today's webinar, we plan to select a few questions that reflect a diversity of perspectives and consider both the local and non-local voices to share out loud. Thank you for your understanding as, again, we're just trying to do our best to stay within today's allocated time um, and address the large number of participants that we have on the webinar. And we're so grateful that you're all here. Um, the chat function is intended to be used as a way to get support, logistical support, and also, as you've seen, a way for the project team to drop in links or other information. Um, we are wanting to make sure that technology is not stopping you from participating, um, but we do not have the chat amongst participants enabled in order to minimize um, multitasking. And I also wanted to mention that in addition, another interactive feature to promote participation will be a Google form, and we will bring that up towards the end of the webinar in the last agenda. That will be the opportunity to provide your feedback on your experience today. And so we'll talk more about that when we get there. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So being mindful of the large number of participants we have on the call today, we need to move forward with the understanding that everyone is willing to abide by these agreements. So thank you all in advance. And I'll just take a moment to read those out so that we all understand what we're agreeing to and the kind of conversation we're looking to have today. So we ask that everyone listens to build mutual understanding, that everyone openly discusses ideas and issues with others and respects the diversity of perspectives that we might hear today. We encourage you to explore ideas where common ground is the goal, contribute to an inclusive and a collaborative environment, 
speak openly and honestly, and please do keep your comments um, concise and focused to the question or the agenda at hand. We ask that you limit distractions and multitasking. We wish we could be with all of you in person, but we can't, so please do your best to stay engaged. Again, address any concerns about the webinar with the project team. You could do that using the chat, as I've mentioned, or the email. And lastly, personal attacks and disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. So, you know, we appreciate everyone's patience as we learn together with the first webinar. We're looking for feedback so that we can continue to improve moving forward um, and so that we hope we can all abide to these agreements today and we can make modifications for future webinars if additional um, agreements are needed to help support a collaborative discussion. Next slide. Okay, so the webinar goals, um, all of you hopefully have downloaded today's agenda on the shop website and seen this. Um, so just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, there's four goals for today's conversation. The first is to really engage the North Coast community and others interested in renewable energy in a collaborative discussion about the feasibility of offshore wind energy for the California North Coast and its potential to contribute to California's clean energy and climate goals. And we spoke to that during um, today's opening remarks. The second goal is to provide an overview of the offshore wind studies recently conducted by the Schott Energy Research Center and engage in a conversation with the community about how these studies may help to inform local, state, and federal policy discussion. Next slide, please. Share report findings regarding the offshore wind generation capacity on California's north coast, the challenges related to the limited capacity of existing local transmission infrastructure, and the economic viability of wind development, as well as potential economic and employ employment benefits. And we'll really speak to, work to these when we hear from Mark and Arnie in their presentation. And lastly, of course, we want to hear community knowledge and perspective about exploring local offshore wind energy development. And we hope to hear from all of you during, through the Q&A and during the community discussion. So very briefly, a look at today's agenda. We start at two, we're almost through with the welcome and goals. Um, we will hand it over to Arnie to provide us a presentation on understanding the offshore wind energy landscape, followed up by a presentation by Mark that dives into the research studies. Um, and within this third agenda item is when we will have our panel discussion with our five panelists. We'll then open the lines for the community discussion. And so encourage you again to submit your questions, however is best, um, including writing them on a notepad next to you so you don't forget them. And then before we conclude, we'll share some next steps for both the webinar series and other offshore wind energy conversations going on as well as provide that link to the Google form that I mentioned so we can um, gain your feedback on what to celebrate and what needs some improvement before next week's webinar. Next slide. Okay, so with that, let's turn it over um, to Arnie. Arnie's gonna provide an overview of the offshore wind technology and how wind shore can, offshore wind can contribute to California's clean energy and climate targets. Arnie will also share information about the Shop Center offshore wind energy studies, including their purpose and their scope. And just a reminder that we will have more details about all of the aspects of the various studies over these five webinars. And so if questions come up that are um, maybe out of the scope for today's conversation, we'll put those in the parking lot and address those during a future webinar. Um, a reminder that we will keep the lines muted and invite the questions via the Q&A box. So please take it away, Arnie. Thank you so much, Sarah. And again, thanks to all of you for joining today. As Sarah mentioned, I'll uh, give a brief uh, introduction to offshore wind and um, uh, the potential for developing offshore wind on the, on the North Coast. Um, and I think um, from a um, uh, contextual uh, perspective or a starting point, I think it's useful to um, start by thinking about uh, climate change and the um, urgent need to, to address climate change. So climate change is of course a reality and greenhouse gas emissions from energy use are the primary cause. Um, here in California, we've been experiencing um, 
uh, a, a series of fires, which are of course not caused only by climate change, but certainly climate change is a significant contributing factor to all of that. Um, uh, so I think the 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 need to to take action to address those sorts of issues, um, both in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also in terms of increasing resilience here on the north coast as well as around the world, is um, is I think quite clear. Um, California has set um, what I think are uh, appropriately aggressive climate and clean energy targets, um, appropriate for, for seeking to address the issue. And as has been mentioned earlier, offshore wind uh, could be a part of, of the solution. Um, in terms of the um, resource here on the North Coast, uh, the offshore wind resource that we have is uh, enormous. Um, uh, when you look up and down the California coast uh, in the, on the right hand side of this, uh, this figure, the um, wind resource is stronger in areas that have uh, darker colors and weaker in areas where, where the, the colors are lighter. And so you, you can see on the, on the north coast we have uh, a much stronger wind resource than other parts of the state. And in fact, um, uh, the uh, north coast of California and southern Oregon have the strongest offshore winds in the continent, continental United States. So uh, we have a, a very strong uh, resource. If um, a 200 square mile uh, area about 20 miles off, off the coast from Humboldt Bay were developed for offshore wind, um, that could uh, generate uh, approximately 4% of the state of California's uh, electricity from, from that resource. So it's quite significant, uh, not just on the scale of our region, but in, in terms of the scale of the, of the state of the, as a whole, in terms of the, the, the potential that's, uh, that's there. Um, offshore wind development, uh, as has been mentioned, would also represent a significant in innovation. Um, if uh, this were to be developed in the relatively uh, near term, um, this could be the first offshore wind farm along the Pacific coast of the Americas, anywhere from Alaska to, to Chile. Um, uh, in terms of offshore wind technology, uh, there are multiple approaches for mounting uh, wind turbines uh, or developing wind farms, uh, uh, including fixed bottom and floating platform designs. Um, the floating platform designs are are uh, what would be used in deeper water and fixed bottom foundations in shallower water. Uh, the turbines themselves are conventional, so they're much like the same types of uh, wind turbines that are used in commercial uh, wind farms, although some of the ones that are contemplated for offshore are on the larger size of, of those. Um, but really there's nothing special about the turbines themselves compared to, to conventional land-based uh, wind turbines. Um, because we have deep waters along uh, not just our region, but the entire uh, west coast, offshore wind would need to use a floating platform uh, style design. Um, and just to put this in context, most of the global offshore wind industry is based on fixed bottom foundations uh, to date. Most installations are in Europe and in Asia. Um, and floating platform systems are very much an emerging technology. They account for less than 1% of global offshore wind installed capacity. Uh, so most of, of the offshore wind industry is uh, fixed foundations um, and in, in Europe and Asia, uh, th this would be, um, what would be developed here if, if, if that were to proceed would be based on, on very much a, an emerging technology. Um, the systems are quite large, um, so the, the scenarios that we uh, addressed in our study were for um, uh, 12 megawatt turbines, which are on the larger side compared to, to um, what's mostly being used commercially in land-based wind farms at this, at this stage. Most of those systems tend to be on the uh, order of two to maybe six or eight megawatts. Um, but we're anticipating by the time these are deployed in an offshore setting that a 12 megawatt turbine might be a, a common size. And, those would have a hub height um, that is about 450 feet above the ocean surface. Uh, we included a humpback whale in the image just for scale. Uh, it's about a 43 foot long humpback whale. So you can get, get a sense of, of the, the scale of, of these systems. 
from, uh, from this image. Um, and then in terms of how they would be uh, placed in the ocean um, in, a, in a wind farm, they would be separated by a mile or more. And that's done to avoid having the wake from one turbine interfere with the available wind for the, for the next one. And so you would expect um, at least uh, perhaps one mile spacing between, between turbines or something on that order. Um, from a uh, project development perspective, uh, the process of developing offshore wind is complex and it involves um, a fairly extensive permitting process, including uh, permits from federal, state, and, uh, and in some cases, uh, local agencies. Um, at this stage, as Nessie Sumate mentioned earlier, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has de designated a call area for an offshore wind leasing process, but the lease auction has not yet occurred. Um, uh, we don't know the exact timing of that, uh, of that leasing process, but uh, perhaps it would happen next year sometime in 2021. Um, uh, after the um, lease auction occurs, it could take developers anywhere on the order of maybe five to seven years to develop, to receive all the permits and build uh, a wind farm. So if everything proceeded um, as uh, a along that kind of a timeline, the, the earliest you would imagine something being built would be in the latter part of, of uh, this decade. Uh, so it's not something that is um, imminent, but the uh, processes associated with developing such a thing could, could proceed in the fairly near term. So that, that gives at least a general sense of a possible uh, timeline. As Nessie Sumate had also uh, mentioned, um, uh, offshore wind is being considered in other parts of California, um, and Bohm has identified two offshore wind call areas uh, at uh, Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon, which are near uh, uh, San Luis Obispo on the Central Coast. Um, the wind resource there is not as strong as it is here on the North Coast, but there are some other advantages to those sites. Uh, um, the, um, those sites are closer to um, larger uh, electric load centers, uh, and so um, that's an advantage. And there's also uh, better transmission infrastructure in those in those regions. So there is, uh, I think, um, a strong interest uh, in, in that possibility. Um, however, um, the potential proceed, uh, to proceed there has been limited by Department of Defense concerns related to military mission uh, compatibility. Um, there have been a number of discussions involving the Department of Defense, BOEM, and the state of California uh, about this, but currently the Department of Defense has uh, indicated a wind exclusion area that covers a large fraction of the um, uh, Southern California and the Central Coast. Um, and uh, that has, has been a barrier to development of those resources in that part of the state. Um, and um, we're hopeful that as discussions continue, there will uh, be a way of, of addressing that issue um, and uh, hope, hope that that happens. Um, here on the North Coast, though, um, uh, uh, there isn't a wind exclusion uh, zone, uh, according to the Department of Defense. And upon reviewing um, materials from our team regarding potential scenarios for offshore wind development in the Humboldt call, call area, um, uh, a representative from the Department of Defense indicated that offshore wind development within the Humboldt call area could be compatible with the uh, um, Department of Defense's military mission. And so that same issue is not a constraint um, to this in the same way as it is uh, currently on the Central Coast. Um, in terms of thinking about how a um, floating offshore wind system might work, um, there are, um, uh, of course, the, the wind farm itself is floating. I should emphasize that this diagram is not to scale the wind farm would be much further from shore than is shown here. Um, but uh, so you have the offshore wind, uh, or excuse me, the floating wind farm component and the turbines are connected by uh, electrically to each other. So the red lines here indicate uh, uh, electrical cables. Uh, and then that power has to be brought on shore. Um, here uh, in the Humboldt Bay region, that probably would uh, happen with a boring underneath the bay and then connecting to an interconnection inter point, uh, which would involve a substation. 
um, uh, onshore and then a connection to transmission lines. And so as we're doing the analysis, um, we have to consider not just the, the offshore wind uh, elements of the system, but also the, the onshore components. And not shown here, but also very important are um, uh, activities that would take place within the port um, associated with deployment and um, operation and maintenance of the, of the systems. Uh, and so in thinking about uh, these systems, we've had to think about uh, all of these uh, different elements of the, the, of the system. Um, from a geography perspective, a system might look something like this with offshore wind development in the call area, a cable to bring the power on shore to a connection point. Here it's shown as connecting at the Humboldt Bay substation, which is uh, next to the Humboldt Bay uh, power plant uh, at, at King Salmon. Um, that's not the only possible interconnection point, but uh, that, that's how it's shown here. And, uh, and then uh, connecting to transmission lines. Um, uh, and in terms of scenarios for analysis, uh, um, our team over the past 18 months has anal analyzed three different scenarios to representing different scales of um, offshore wind development. Uh, so we looked at what we would consider to be a pilot scale of element, maybe a 50 megawatt wind farm, which might correspond to four 12 megawatt turbines. Um, uh, a small commercial uh, system uh, on the order of um, 150 megawatts, and that might consist, just as an example, of 12, uh, 12 megawatt turbines. And, um, and then a full build out of the call area. And there um, uh, you could um, install an estimated uh, 1,800 uh, megawatts of, of installed capacity, which might correspond to about 150 uh, or so turbines. Um, and we designed the study this way because scale is a very important theme when considering offshore wind. Larger scale deployments, um, lead to better economic viability due to economies of scale. Larger scale projects also provide greater climate change mitigation and economic development benefits. Um, at the same time, uh, larger scale deployments create more challenges uh, in areas such as local environmental impact and conflicts with existing uses. So there are trade-offs that would have to be considered. And so we designed the study so that we would be able to examine um, both smaller scale and larger scale projects to try and understand uh, the pros and cons of uh, each scenario. Um, uh, the boxes here inside the call area just give us a general sense of how much of the area uh, each of those uh, sized projects might take. The uh, 50 megawatt uh, project uh, would take up a a, a relatively small fraction of that area, 150 megawatts, somewhat larger. And then the 1800 megawatt uh, scenario was the full build out of that, of that indicated area. Now, of course, the 50 and 150 megawatt uh, projects wouldn't necessarily be built uh, in the location within the call area as shown there. That was just meant to give a sense of, of the scale of the, of the likely projects or the projects of that size, sorry. Um, in terms of how that relates to um, our local electricity demand, a pilot scale project on the order of 50 megawatts could supply about 25% of our local electricity. Um, a small commercial project on the order of 150 megawatts might supply something on the order of 75% of our local electricity uh, or produce a, a fraction that's equivalent to that. And a full build out uh, at 1800 megawatts um, uh, would be quite a bit larger than our local demand. Uh, we estimate it to be about nine times larger than our local demand. So after um, uh, supplying uh, what's needed locally, the, the balance would, uh, would need to be exported to other parts of the, of the state. Um, in our scenarios, we also looked at possible transmission routes uh, and considered both um, overland transmission routes to the east and to the south as well as the possibility of subsea transmission to the south connecting uh, into the Bay Area. Uh, and so in doing our analysis, we looked at all of those, uh, those scenarios as well. Um, the full um, breadth of our, our um, analysis is, is uh, indicated here. So um, along with the funders for each of the 
of the three pieces. Um, and so we, we covered a range of, of topics. What we're covering here today in, in, uh, in this session is um, the resource assessment, uh, grid compatibility and transmission related issues, um, the subsea cable and economic analysis covering both economic uh, viability and also economic uh, development uh, benefits. And other topics will be covered uh, in subsequent uh, webinars. The schedule of, of webinars uh, is of course shown here and is available on the Schatz Center website. Um, and so we encourage you to come to some of the se subsequent sessions uh, uh, as well. Uh, I'll close by just uh, again acknowledging our funders as well as all of the team members. Um, uh, here we're listing um, uh, all of the people from uh, Humboldt State University uh, from our uh, both at the Schott Center and some colleagues um, from other departments who participated in this study um, and uh, our major partners which include PG&E, uh, Mott McDonald Engineering, HD Harvey and Associates and the Navy Region Southwest. Um, really grateful for all of the, the collaboration. And with that, I will um, pass uh, things back over to, to Sarah um, and stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you, Arnie. Wonderful. So it looks like we do have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, we've been getting questions coming in from the chat and um, our team has also been checking the email. So the first question that we have that I will read aloud, um, is it true that none of the studies thus far have studied the impact of offshore wind on existing ocean uses and marine resources? Um, so the, the analysis that we've done so far has covered um, environmental impact uh, and um, a, a set of related things, but it's true that um, the analysis that we've done has not covered um, existing uses such as fisheries. It's my understanding that there is a, a separate study that's being developed uh, in, in relationship to, to, uh, to fisheries. Thank you, Arnie. There's another question um, that I think I might be able to address. The question is, what about the effect of turbines on birds? And I might just say that we'll be talking about birds and other impacts to biology and ecology in the future webinar. Right, that, that moving to that, the next. Yeah, that will be covered in the next webinar, the one on the 21st. Thank you, Arnie. Yeah. Next question. Could you please discuss how offshore wind coordinates the goals of RCEA's comprehensive action plan for energy? Um, I actually think that that's a question that we should hold um, until later in the session because Matthew Marshall of RCEA is one of the panelists for the session and I think he's better positioned to answer that question than, than, than I am. Thank you, Arnie. We have a question about will Arnie's slideshow be available? Um, I can address that by saying that all of the presentations from all of the webinars will be made available on the shots. Uh, center's website following the webinars. Okay. okay, and it looks like we can take another question. What are 10 meters in your in, in your web page introduction? What are 10 meters per second and 90 to 120 meters in US customary system measurements? If you want to include the public, please translate to miles per hour and feet that are used in regular local weather reports and common non-academic usage. And Sarah, okay, this so is really for the note. That there was a, a very uh, kind person who responded to this in the chat to Vivian's question. Certainly can revisit it as it's helpful, but I believe that there was a translation that was done and really appreciate Vivian highlighting the need to use um, metrics that are, that are helpful for folks. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. At this time, we'll just check in. Do we have any questions from the email or shall we move on to the next agenda item? I think we're good to go. Perfect, thank you, Maya. Okay, so now we will 
move on to the next agenda item, exploring research findings related to power generation, transmission, and economic development. And we will invite Mark Severy, the former Wind Studies Project Manager at the Schott Center, um, now at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, to present results on the potential for wind farms off Humboldt Bay to generate electricity for the California grid, including the requirements and challenges for delivering electric power from the North Coast to other parts of the state. He is also planning to discuss findings related to the economic viability of offshore wind in the region and opportunities for economic and job development. A reminder that we will continue to keep the lines muted and invite questions via the Q&A and the email. And after the Q&A, we'll move to the panel discussion to hear the diverse community members' thoughts and impressions of the findings that Arnie and Mark have just shared with us. So Mark, if you'd like to take it away and um, begin your presentation, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Sarah, and, and thanks, Arnie, Nessie, and Karen for the introduction um, to this webinar series. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, as Sarah mentioned, I'm really going to focus on the energy production, the delivery or transmission of that energy, and then the economic viability and economic development. Um, so that's what my presentation is going to focus on. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Mark Severy. I'm a research engineer at the Pacific Northwest National Lab, but for the past uh, 18 months, I worked at the Schatz Center with Arnie Jacobson, studying the opportunities and challenges of offshore wind development in Humboldt County. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide and just give you a brief outline for this presentation. First, I'll describe the energy generation potential of offshore wind turbines in this region. Then I will describe the electricity transmission system that will deliver, deliver that energy throughout the region. Next, I'll cover the costs and economic viability of offshore wind. And lastly, I'll present the anticipated job creation and economic development values. And the first thing I wanna do in this presentation is really highlight the main findings before we get into the more specifics. <clears throat> so number one, um, there's a large offshore wind resource on the North Coast that can support progress towards meeting California's climate and clean energy goals. Number two, there is limited transmission infrastructure connecting Humboldt County to the rest of California, which is a major barrier for developing offshore wind in the North Coast. Number three, larger wind farms can achieve lower costs of energy because of economies of scale. Smaller initial projects can be used to develop the, to demonstrate the technology, but a developer will likely want to see a pathway to larger projects that can be more economically viable. And number four, um, offshore wind has good potential to create a significant number of jobs in the region and also elsewhere in California. For example, a 150 megawatt wind farm with 12 turbines would create approximately 3,000 construction jobs and then 2,000 ongoing operational jobs. So those are the four key points that we're gonna to get to throughout the presentation. And first, um, um, on that next slide, we will um, just start out by looking at the average yearly wind speed offshore California. And Arnie showed this slide where the darker shades of green highlight higher wind speeds, which are predominantly focused um, offshore Humboldt County. The shaded region offshore shows the area that BOEM is currently considering for lease. Our analysis looks at three scales of wind development in the region. Um, so if we click, um, we'll get a, a little graphic showing these three different scales. And Ar Ar Arnie kind of mentioned this too, but I wanna um, just reiterate here. So we're looking at a small 50 megawatt wind farm, which is kind of, it would be four turbines, um, five square miles, and then a 150 megawatt um, wind farm consisting of 12 turbines. And then lastly, the third scenario we're looking at is 1.8 gigawatts, which is 1800 megawatts that could be placed throughout the entire BOEM call area. So that's the largest scale, scale we're looking at. On the next slide, we're looking at um, what the power generation profile would be from one of these wind farms. So the power output from a wind farm depends, as you might expect, on the wind speed. These charts show three different example weeks in June and July with different generation profiles. The top chart shows a week with low wind speeds and hence low power generation. 
the middle chart <clears throat> shows a week with variable power generation. And then the bottom chart shows a week with nearly maximum power generation throughout the entire week. These charts highlight that power generation varies from week to week and, and day to day. And, and if there's variability even within the same season. There are weeks where there's sustained high power generation, but also a few weeks where there's sustained low power generation. Um, on the next slide, um, we're going to see um, if we look at these results, um, or if we took those example weeks, but instead looked at it over the course of an entire year, we would see that about 50% of the maximum energy is produced. This value is often referred to as the capacity factor. Offshore wind in this region would have a capacity factor near 50%, which is among the best offshore um, wind capacity factors in the United States. <clears throat> the calculations we use to get here um, take into account inefficiencies and downtime that may include um, inefficiencies on uh, or line losses on the transmission cables, maintenance or, or uh, servicing of the wind turbines, wake losses, and then downtime for extreme weather events. So um, that 50% value includes all of those losses. Um, and then comparing offshore wind to other renewable resources, we see that offshore wind actually has a very favorable capacity factor. So if we compared it to land-based wind, um, often land-based wind farms have a capacity factor in the range of 30 to 40%, depending on the site. And then compared to solar, a solar capacity factor um, for a large scale um, solar, wind, solar farm may be between 15 and 30%. And so <clears throat> now we want to see with this en energy generation profile, how does it impact or how can it um, help improve or change the generation profile in Humboldt County specifically? So let's go to the next slide <clears throat> and we'll look at um, the existing generation profile and then the addition, how off the addition of offshore wind changes the different sources of energy. Um, that meet Humboldt County's energy demand. So this bar chart shows the local generation sources that are used to meet um, the Humboldt, Humboldt County's electricity demand. The bar on the left shows the, shows the electricity demand for the year 2030 before the installation of offshore wind. And we use this future scenario because it's more reflective of a time where offshore wind may be in the water. So on the bottom of that bar, we see there's an orange and a yellow um, portion which indicate energy coming from two local biomass plants and then the rest of the energy shown in purple comes either from imported electricity or from the natural gas fired Humboldt Bay generating station. Other sources such as hydropower or solar are too small to be seen on this graphic at this scale. The dashed line going horizontal indicates the uh, energy usage in Humboldt County. So that is shown consistently across the other bars that we'll start to focus on now. So next, if we look at the, the second bar, um, we see that's the addition of 50 megawatts of offshore wind. And the blue portion indicates the amount of offshore wind energy that's coming to serve the local um, needs. And that's maybe about 20% of the energy demand. In the second scenario, the 150 megawatt offshore wind farm, about 40% of local energy demand is met through offshore wind. And then the light blue portion shows the fraction of energy that is exported to a different region of the state. <clears throat> and then lastly, we're gonna look at the largest wind farm. So this is building out the entire uh, Boehm call area. We see that a slightly more Wind, uh, wind energy is used locally, so that comprises about 50% of local demand. And then a similar amount is exported, that's the light blue fraction. But then importantly, on this, um, on this chart, we see there's the white and blue hatched area, which is offshore wind that must be curtailed. And what this means is that there's not enough capacity on the transmission lines to accommodate that power to be sent to other areas in the state. So the turbines would need to be turned off. And I include, if we advance to the next slide, I include a little picture here of like 
uh, on this larger graphic, I had to actually go go back one. I'm sorry. Um, on this larger graphic, I had to create this little um, broken area on the vertical axis on the large screen because there's so much energy from that large uh, wind farm that's curtailed. So this smaller chart on the right just shows the same same data, um, but without the broken vertical axis. So <clears throat> I think what we see here, I think overall from this slide, the main takeaways are offshore wind can make significant contributions to um, the Humboldt County generation pro profile and, and contribute um, a good deal of renewable energy. But at certain large scales, um, it's clear that transmission upgrades will need to be built to accommodate additional um, power. <clears throat> the addition of offshore wind would reduce the reliance of imp uh, Humboldt County's reliance on imports and natural gas, but it won't completely eliminate them. That's because when there's periods of low wind speed um, and the, the turbines aren't generating much power, we still need to find a way to, to meet that energy demand. And so with the infrastructure we have now, that would either be through imports or through the natural gas fired uh, plant here locally. And now we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and this is just a summary of some of the electric um, production values. So this highlights how many turbines and the footprint of the three scenarios we looked at. And then if we click once more, we will see the annual electricity production from each one of these scales. So 200, 600, and 7,500 gigawatt hours per year. And if we do one more click, we'll see how this compares uh, to California and Humboldt County usage. So um, kind of those two smaller scales make significant contributions towards Humboldt County's electricity use, but then the large scale really uh, makes a significant um, dent in California's energy usage. So that could be up to three or four percent of California's energy demand. And then the last thing on this slide, if we do one more advance, um, is just the um, total amount of that energy that is used locally. So <clears throat> In you know the, you see in the 50 megawatt scale, all of the energy is used locally. But as the set scale increases, there's times where this power needs to be sent um, to other portions of the state. And these bottom two rows indicate how much is used locally versus how much is is used elsewhere. <clears throat> so next um, on the next slide and beyond, I'm going to start talking about the transmission system. So this is how energy generated off the coast of Humboldt County can be connected and delivered to other regions throughout the state. So Humboldt County transmission system is isolated and it's designed to have existing generators um, meet the majority of the regional load. The transmission system was not necessarily designed to be a net exporter of electricity. So there's limited transmission infrastructure into and out of the region. Um, this graphic shows how that electricity system works. And so these orange dots indicate electric generators within the county boundary. And then on the bottom that there's a fifth generator, which is offshore wind, which we kind of insert into the region to see how it um, changes things. And then all of these yellow and green lines um, going into and out of the circle indicate the transmission lines that connect uh, Humboldt County to the rest of the state. On the next slide, we'll see a map. <clears throat> and this is just highlighting the point of how Humboldt County is connected. Um, here's, this is the map of no Northern California. And the lines on this map are not roads, but they're transmission lines. Um, these are the highways that electricity uses to move between the power plants and the end uses. Um, so darker lines here indicate transmission lines with higher voltages, which can move more power. Um, you'll notice that in Humboldt County, there's none of these dark lined high voltage transmission lines. So one of the main things that <clears throat> offshore wind may need to do is have transmission lines that can carry more capacity to interconnect into that um, high, high capacity, high voltage system throughout the state. Um, and then on the next slide, this is just a, a kind of a striking photo that shows the difference between the scales of different 
um, types of transmission. So in the background, this is a 500 kilovolt, which is a very high transmission, high, high voltage transmission, transmission line that goes through the north and south portion uh, of the state. And then in the foreground is a 115 kilovolt transmission line that is actually connecting um, Humboldt County to the Central Valley. So if we click again, a little map will show up and it just shows where this picture was taken. So the, the wooden line here is actually connecting between Bridgeville and I believe it's Cottonwood just south of Redding. And then the, the metal, the large metal lines in the background uh, are one of the lines running north and south um, in the state. So it just kind of shows um, what our infrastructure looks like now and kind of not necessarily where it would need to be, but just kind of what the differences um, look like. All right, so what we wanted hey, to Mark? do, yes. Just wanted to do a time check. We have you completing around 3.15, your presentation. Does that timing feel correct? That, that will be great, yeah, thanks. Perfect, so 10 minutes, thank you. Great, and so to understand what amount of transmission upgrades are needed, we conducted a study in partnership with PG&E um, to estimate two things. One, what transmission upgrades are needed, and two, um, provide a high level cost estimate of what they would cost. So um, there's a set of assumptions we used for that. So next slide. Um, and the assumptions are basically just assume the generators are operating at all times of the year. And this would allow um, transmission upgrades to be built to eliminate overload, especially during peak summer and off-peak spring conditions. And so there's no curtailment of offshore wind, but all generators are just producing at their full capacity. And on the next slide, we'll start to see um, what these results look like. And so this is just looking at a 50 megawatt wind farm, so the smallest scale. Um, I highlight here where upgrades would need to be built. And the takeaway is that even at the small scale, there's still new transmission lines that would need to be built to accommodate and uh, to provide safety and redundancy of existing transmission lines to make sure there's no overloads um, on the existing lines. The costs for the small scale are disproportionately high compared to large scale, which we'll see later. Um, and an, an initial development should consider creative approaches to try to reduce the transmission costs, either by using storage or curtailment to try to minimize the costs and infrastructure upgrades at this, at this initial scale. And then on the next slide, we'll see um, what transmission options might look like for a large scale development. Um, so our study identified four potential options for interconnecting uh, 1800 megawatt wind farm between um, Humboldt County to regions of the California electricity grid that can absorb and use that much power. So here we identified two overland options and then two subsea options. And then going to the next slide, um, we'll see what the costs look like for all of these scales. So um, the cost, as you might expect, they increase as the size of the wind farm and hence the transmission line increase. Um, so the, the colored region here indicates the range of expected costs with the black line indicating our best estimate. And one thing to note, I guess, is that the blue subsea transmission costs are slightly more expensive than what the overland transmission might look like. And then on the, on the next slide, we actually will take those costs, but instead of just looking at the initial capital costs, we take that, take that value and divide it by the capacity of the line. So this gives you the cost per unit of energy um, transmitted, I guess. So um, we see that in, in, when we look at it this way, the initial projects are more expensive in terms of cost per megawatt compared to the larger projects, which are, um, are less expensive in, in dollars per megawatt. And these costs um, actually align very closely with past transmission costs um, for recent projects in California. So while the values may seem high, they're actually um, aligned with existing or, or recent projects. And so I think this kind of slide brings up an important question or, or kind of, um, 
yeah, brings up an important discussion point. So smaller wind farms may be more suitable for initial project, but the, co the cost um, is more expensive per unit of energy that they're providing. So finding a pathway from the smaller initial projects to the larger, more affordable projects may be an interesting thing that developers would want to pursue. And this bears out not only in terms of the transmission costs, but then also in terms of the cost for the entire wind farm. So on the next slide, we see um, the cost for building the wind farm and what the energy from that wind farm would look like. We put together all of the costs for the turbines, the platforms, the port components, and ongoing operations and maintenance activities, and evaluated how much that electricity would cost from each, web, from each wind farm. Here, there's a similar story to the transmission, where larger wind farms produce energy at a lower cost. Um, the initial projects, um, from the initial project, the larger project you see there's maybe a 40% um, decrease in costs. And the larger projects are, are interesting because they can become more competitive in state electricity markets. And developers may um, be interested to smart, start with these small projects, but it's likely that they'll want a pathway to the larger projects that can be more cost competitive. And these, that the, the costs that were built into this model came from an expectation that a wind farm would be built in 2027. Um, but um, estimates or cost estimates for the industry expect the costs will continue to drop into the 2030s and beyond. So these values actually could be lower depending on the construction and operation date. Next slide, please. And so now in the last portion of the presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the economic development and job creation values. And this first slide is just gonna highlight how that modeling was done. So first we see that there, we cut into the model, we input um, three important values. One is the costs of the wind farm, the cost of the port, and the cost of the transmission upgrades. And so <clears throat> let's click to the next slide. And so we put in the capital expenditure in total dollars and then the operating expenses in dollars per year. And then um, we tell what type of industry it is. So um, what comes about, about from that is that there's supply chain implications and then there's induced expenses and indirect jobs created from the industries. And that what we get out from the calculations is the amount of jobs that are created both for construction and then also for operations. And then what's the economic output? So on the next slide, we will start to see some of the results. And here we just plot out the number of construction jobs in gray and the number of operation jobs. So these are annual jobs for the 25 year lifetime of the project of what it would look like for each of the project scales. And so these jobs include not just building and maintaining the wind farm infrastructure, but also operating the supply chain, building the port facility, building the transmissions, um, engineering, servicing vessels, accounting, a whole range of different jobs. Um, so um, I guess one main takeaway from this is that a significant number of jobs are created at all scales, but larger projects create more jobs just because there's more infrastructure and more supply chain activities around, about that. On the next slide, we will see what's the economic development. So this is how much um, economic development or money is there surrounding the development of the project. And so this first on the left, we just show the construction phase economic output. So this is the units are in millions of dollars so that a thousand million is equal to 1 billion. Um, and we see that uh, the values increase as you expect um, based on the scale. And then on the next slide, or if we just advance one, we see the annual operating phase um, economic output. So this is an annual thing throughout the lifetime of the project. As a comparison point, <clears throat> in 2018, Humboldt County um, had approximately $6.8 billion of what's considered GDP. And then California was uh, 3,000 billion. So um, these numbers 
are significant when we compare it to those metrics. And then if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna touch back um, on the key takeaways from this presentation. So number one, the offshore wind resource on the North Coast is enormous and could make significant contributions to California's renewable energy generation. Number two, <clears throat> transmission challenges are different depending on the scale of development. Smaller, co smaller projects face dis disproportionately high transmission investment, investment costs, but maybe an important first step for California offshore wind. And future large scale development would require significant investments and coordination at the state planning level to achieve these types of transmission upgrades. Number three, strategies need to be developed to reduce the transmission costs for the first initial project and hence make <clears throat> initial development more appealing. And then number four is that the offshore wind industry provides an opportunity to bring a new industry to Humboldt County, County offering significant job and economic benefits. And so to close on the next slide, I just wanna <clears throat> acknowledge both the funding agencies and the partners in PG&E and Mott McDonald Engineering who provided significant contributions to this work. And then next is um, just uh, a picture of me with my contact information. If you would like to follow up with me directly, um, my email address is there. And then I think that would wrap it up uh, for my presentation. So thanks for sticking with me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, so we have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, we'll take those questions that are coming in through the Q&A chat and also any questions that have come in uh, via email. So the first question is, why isn't the zone for turbines located further to the north where the wind is stronger? Um, Go ahead, I think that, yeah, that's a good question. And I think that the selection of that area really falls back onto a process um, borne out by BOEM and the state of California in selecting and identifying where that call area is. So we wanted to study an area that is relevant to future planning and future development. In that region, I think others um, on the webinar might be able to speak to it better, but it was selected through a combination of several factors, including wind speed, but then also location to port and location to an interconnection point, which can make significant impacts on the economic um, costs that go into it. So the further something is away from a serviceable port, the longer the vessel track, the longer the, longer the travel time is and the more expensive it is just to, to develop there. So it's kind of a, I think it was identified as a sweet spot of um, wind speed resource and then also uh, costs that might be needed to, to service and install. Perfect, thank you, Mark. We have a follow-up question to Roland's question um, that was just asked from Jared. Have you considered the possibility that wind patterns may change as climate change progresses? <clears throat> I think that's a, a really good and interesting question. Um, and it certainly could be possible, though it's not included in the wind speed modeling that we have uh, access to right now. So um, we are planning to update our assessment um, based on the most recent wind speed model, which is just came out maybe a month or a week ago. Um, but I'm not sure how uh, climate change may affect the wind speed patterns in this region. That's a good question though. Thank you. A question from Shiloh. In the annual energy demand plot, can you help me to understand why any wind energy is curtailed in the 150 megawatt development? Yeah, of course. Um, and, and thanks for asking that so, so we can help clarify. Um, there's times when there might be low local demand. So let's say the local demand is 100 um, and also the wind speed is at max capacity or is it max production that might be 150. So in that <clears throat> time, you might need to, and 
the transmission line can't accept that additional 50 megawatts. So there's, there might be times when you actually need to curtail a little bit of offshore wind because the, de the local demand is low and the transmission capacity is limited. So there's times you might need to curtail versus if the local demand was high, that same amount of power could be absorbed by local uses of it. Perfect, thank you, Mark. A question from Michael. Could you please comment on the degree to which storage, short term and long term, could increase the amount of energy produced that could be used locally? I don't have any calculations that can support my answer, but I think that question really is forward looking and important. Um, the costs and idea of storage is kind of a, a trade off. Um, so if there's additional energy that's going to be produced, is it going to be more economical to store it in batteries and use it locally? Or is it going to be more economical to make uh, transmission investments that can help support renewable energy development and use and grid resiliency in other portions of the state as well? So it's kind of would be, I think, thinking through that question, it would really be a trade-off between the cost of local storage versus the cost of transmission development to connect to other regions. And I, I think it's also important to add that there are, like there's benefits to using renewable energy locally, but there's also benefits that Humboldt County would realize from having improved transmission infrastructure because it would improve redundancy both for communities around Humboldt Bay, but then also importantly communities along the path of that transmission line upgrade. Thank you, Mark. Another question, uh, this one from Ross. When will or what is the feasibility of building and maintaining such structures? Local fishermen have their doubts about engineering overcoming nature. Also, has the full scale, the, eight, the 1,800 megawatt farm, would there be storage device required in Humboldt County? Um, so that's a, a good question. And I think it's kind of broken into two parts. So the first part being, what's the technical feasibility and, and have, has this technology been demonstrated? And I think the, the short answer there is it has been demonstrated primarily um, in Europe. So there's an existing wind farm in Scotland that uses the same technologies that we're talking about here. So it's the floating um, wind turbines on, on platforms. And there's been several demonstration projects both in uh, Japan and off the coast of Portugal that kind of demonstrate the technology. and while this is a new application of these floating substructures and floating platforms, I think the industry is actually quite old because it brings engineering expertise kind of from oil and gas um, that have developed in like deep sea ocean monitoring that have developed kind of um, floating platforms for, for deep waters offshore. <clears throat> um, and then the Thank second part know. of that question, which was about um, storage is, um, I, I think that really comes up to the specific design of, of the, the project. Thank you. So I just want to say out loud that we have a lot more questions coming in than we have time for, as we had imagined. So thank you to Mark for your presentation and addressing those. Um, we are continuing to keep the, the record of, of those questions, and we encourage you to bring those up um, during the community discussion. And I'm now going to segue us over um, into the panelist discussion. Let me just screen share. And maybe while you're doing that, Sarah, I'll just say out loud, this mm -hmm. is really just a gentle reminder to folks to, as you're able, provide your questions or send your questions via the Q&A function rather than the chat. Um, the chat was intended to be more of that technical support. We just want to make sure we're not losing any of that as we go. And if you could use the Q&A function, that would be super helpful and allow us to be responsive in sometimes in real time. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, so we can everyone see the screen. I'll take yes. that as a yes. Okay, thank you. So we're really honored to have five members of our local community and the broader renewable energy community um, as panelists today to share their thoughts and their reflections about the information that's just been shared and about the research overall. Um, so these panelists were selected based on their expertise and because they represent a variety of perspectives related to the potential for offshore wind development on California's North Coast. 
So I'd first like to welcome um, our five panelists, and you should see their names on the screen. We've got Jason Ramos, the Tribal Council Vice Chair, Deputy Tribal Administrator from Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe of California. Matthew Marshall, Executive Director of Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Donna Wright, President and CEO of the Greater Eureka Chamber of Commerce. Marco Rios, Manager, Trans Transmission System Planning of Pacific Gas and Electric. And Neil Raffin, Regulatory Analyst Integrated Resource Planning Energy Division from the California Public Utilities Commission. So thank you all to our panelists for being here today. We're so excited to hear what you have to say. So I will present each one of you with a question and then I will ask you to kindly limit your response to three or four minutes. Um, in an effort to keep things moving on time, I'll find a suitable place to interrupt if I think that we're um, getting a little bit tight on time and we need to move forward to the next panelist. So thank you for your understanding. We want to make sure that we can hear from all of you. So I will stop screen sharing so that we can see um, all of your faces and ask the first question to Jason. Make sure we have Jason up. Okay, looks great. So Jason, would you please address how do you feel about offshore wind development? What are the benefits and concerns that are most important to you? Well, um, generally, we're, we feel pretty good about it. Um, I think it's, it's an exciting prospect. Um, I think there's a number of different benefits. You know, from our own experience, we've done um, our own uh, alternative energy product projects with pg and &E and Shots Energy, or CERC. Um, we've got two microgrids that help mitigate our greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, they allow for our the continu continu um, continuity of operations in and around the power, public safety power shutoffs. Our power never goes off, um, so it's been uh, it's been tremendous for us there. And you know we save a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in electrical costs with that pro with that uh, project. So we look at those projects generally, and we didn't know that going in that it was going to be so beneficial. And you know from afar. We see this this project coming and say, "Hey, look! Um, a lot, most of the time, in our experience, it's been far more positive um, than we thought it was." I think nationally, you know, we're um, there. There, it's going to be a priority to be able to meet the challenges of climate change to develop wind er, wind, in, wind energy. I was uh, online a little earlier looking at the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. They've got a a wind vision uh, roadmap report from 2017 and one of the take homes from that uh, document was that estimated by 2050 there's going to be 600,000 new jobs created uh, in the wind energy field and it, wind energy will support about 35 percent of uh, the U.S. power by that by that time frame 2050. So for all of those reasons we're um, we're excited about it. Fantastic, thank you. And in terms of, you spoke to what you're excited about and the benefits, do you have um, any concerns that you wanted to, to bring forward and talk about a bit about how those concerns might be overcome? Yeah, there's a, we do have some concerns. I mean, uh, the fishing industry here impacts on the fishing industry, both sport and commercial uh, industry industries are, is a concern. You know, as uh, tribal leaders, we're always concerned about marine life we're concerned about access and, and the protection of our cultural resources. So those are all concerns. Um, you know, in Humboldt County, you know, there's a long history in Humboldt County of boom and bust cycles with industries. We saw it first with gold, we saw it with timber, we saw it most recently with cannabis. And so what we see in these industries is that there's, this, there's an impact on the environment during the course of resource extraction and then the citizens of Humboldt County and the tribes are left with the environmental impacts when people leave. So we're, we're concerned that this isn't another one of those scenarios, that it's just not an, uh, it's just not investment in wind infrastructure or electrical infrastructure, but it's investment in, in people and human capital, that there's some lo long lasting prospect for job opportunities for the citizens of, of Humboldt County I mean, the, the poverty rate here in Humboldt County is at 20.8%, which is about 7% higher 
than the state average. The median household income is $43,000, where it's $75,000 in the, as the average in the rest of California. And we have three times the amount of homeless people here. So it's tremendous opportunity in, in, in the development of this industry. We just want to make sure that, you know, in the deployment and rollout that, you know, it has some long lasting economic benefit for the county. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to move to Matthew, please. Matthew, welcome you to have your video up, if that's helpful. Thanks. So Matthew, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority has indicated strong interest in offshore wind development, including the creation of a coalition to pursue a project. What is RCEA's current interest in offshore wind? And what do you see as next steps for offshore wind development in the region? Thanks. And um, you know, for, for folks that aren't familiar with um, RCEA that aren't local, perhaps, um, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority is a joint powers agency of the County of Humboldt, all the incorporated cities in Humboldt County and the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District. So we're a, a local government agency tasked with developing sustainable energy solutions for, for Humboldt County. Um, and, and one of our initiatives is we're a community choice aggregator, which means that you know, in, in partnership with PG&E, um, we're responsible for the, the, the source of electricity, while PG&E is responsible for the, the delivery of electricity to, to Humboldt County. Um, and so, you know, really central to our mission um, is developing local renewable energy resources to meet our local energy demand. Um, you know, and, and, and that focus on local is both for the, you know, the environmental benefits of reducing overall our dependence on fossil fuels and, and uh, you know, also looking to, uh, you know, realize the economic development benefits, which we saw some, some you know, estimates of what that, that could look like. Um, uh, you know, so you know, de developing local projects means, you know, more, more local jobs as opposed to importing energy. And then the third, the third, third benefit really is about, um, you know, local uh, energy resilience and not being dependent on imported energy, which, you know, for the most part, if we really look at our total energy usage, electricity, natural gas, transportation fuels, we're, we're mostly importing our energy to, to meet our needs here. And so the, the more that we can be locally self-sufficient, you know, that's the responsible thing to do is to meet our needs with low impact, um, you know, minimizing our, our environmental and climate impacts through, through local generation. And then obviously, um, you know, that provides us with a greater self of independence and, and, and less reliance on, on outside energy sources and, and exporting those impacts of our energy use to other communities instead of dealing with them here at home. So, you know, that, you know, sort of the, the broader context of our, our big picture goals and, you know, I, I don't need to restate the, the, the slides that sort of indicated how, um, you know, the, the north coast of California and Southern Oregon have, you know, a world-class offshore wind resource that through technological development is now becoming something that actually could be, um, you know, accessed. And so, you know, when we look at, you know, we're not the sunniest part of, of the state of California, um, but we do have great resources in, in offshore wind in particular. And so that really aligns with those goals and our long-term strategy of meeting our, our local energy needs with local resources. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, from an agency perspective, to, to follow up on some of the comments that Jason had, you know, one of the things that we really want to focus on is, is doing it right, because we are a local entity that's answerable to the community. You know, we're, we're not some outside developer. Um, while we were, we're working with partners to, to try to move forward with, with offshore wind, um, we really want to see things move forward in a way that, that um, you know, it, it, really honors and, and is, is not overly impactful to both our, our, you know, natural resources here as well as our cultural and economic existing resources such as uh, commercial fishing. And so, you know, one of the things that we've really been focusing on in our efforts is engaging local stakeholders from, from local tribes to, to, to local commercial fishermen, environmental groups, labor unions, and really trying to, to, to build this effort in a way that engages the community and reflects our community values because you know we, we we don't want to see it uh, you know mimic those past efforts in the past where you know there's sometimes been you know more external influence and, and more of an extraction mentality and we really want to you know try to balance those those efforts. But the last thing I'll just add is you know as far as the timeline, you know and where things are going from here, you know we're optimistic and you know we we just um, 
completed our integrated resource planning exercise in the, the, the close of a two-year cycle, and we, we did include offshore wind um, you know, in that uh, forecast of what we'll, we'll have online in our portfolio in the coming years. You know, that's in our uh, estimates, we're looking, you know, kind of after 2025, but potentially 2026. A lot of that is, is very dependent on when the, the BOEM lease process moves forward. Um, because, you know, you really can't, um, until there's that site control where someone has a lease, um, you know, that's when really the environmental analysis and a lot of the, 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 the deep technical studies uh, and design work really, you know, begins. Um, I, I will say, you know, that said, you know, part of the reason why um, we're looking at 2026 and not two or three or four years farther than that is because, you know, we've been working on this for the last couple of years um, pretty actively with our partners, um, EDP Renewables, Ocker Solutions, Principal Power. Um, you know, we, we began really working in earnest on this in 2018. And so we've got, you know, a couple of years of, of uh, grid interconnection analysis done um, on, on a, you know, our, our specific project that we're looking to develop, which is in that 100, 150 megawatt range. Um, you know, we, we've been working on engaging stakeholders and doing, you know, preliminary analysis which again, doesn't really pick up until you have that site control from BOEM for federal waters. But, um, but you know, we, we're, we're a couple of years into the process at this point. So I would say, you know, we're, we're ready to get moving really on the, the, the next stage of work um, when, when the time comes. But, um, you know, it, it's not starting, you know, we're not, a, we're not a year zero or a year, you know, two going into year three at this point of, of really trying to understand uh, how to move a, a smaller project forward that can fit within the existing uh, transmission constraints that have been highlighted. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. And just a reminder for our participants, um, we'll be holding, you know, the questions until we get to the discussion um, following the responses by all panelists, but welcome you to continue submitting questions in the Q&A chat. So Donna would love to welcome you um, if you'd like to turn on your camera. The question we have for you today is, what is your perspective on offshore wind development? What benefits could a floating wind farm bring to the North Coast? And also a reminder to unmute yourself by clicking on the mute button on the bottom left if you're needing support. Yeah, I've, uh, I have to apologize that since, I'll oh, start my video, that's right now. Thank you for that. And thank you, Sarah and Ani, for inviting the Chamber to the table to hear our perspective on this. Uh, one of the things uh, that upon joining the Chamber three years ago, I firstly visited our mission statement, being the Greater Eureka Chamber of Commerce, is an organisation of members that promotes and advocates for trade, commerce, jobs and tourism. Uh, we're now 129 years old, so uh, as Jason and uh, others have talked about, we have been there through all the booms and busts. Um, with this in mind, in September 2018, our business and industry chair, Steve Laverty, and I attended the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. In particular, a breakout session, Chambers for Innovation and Clean Energy. As part of the Global uh, Summit, the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and the CICE hosted a lively interactive discussion featuring our local chambers uh, of commerce CEOs from different parts of the country, both urban and rural. At this session, we learned how local chambers around the country are helping their member businesses and communities engage and prosper in the clean energy space. We also explored how local chambers can help create more resilient communities as we confront more extreme weather events. This was important to us, understanding that our community is in a remote area and there were already great work being done by the Blue Lake Rancheria engaging in solar power. There were discussions on both onshore and offshore wind projects and we wanted to be prepared and understand what that would mean for our economy and community. We came, up with, uh, we came away with a great, greater understanding on how supporting renew, renewable energy can support a positive economic growth by the installation of these product projects, creating new jobs during the construction process and the ongoing maintenance. And uh, surprisingly, tourism. It was stated that there was an increase in ecotourism that traveled to the surrounding areas of the East Coast Block Island 
wind farm, creating new opportunities. There was also documented growth in communities that had embraced the clean energy movement. Small and large businesses and individuals are drawn to those communities. Even outside contractors are bought, if, even if outside contractors are bought in initially, there'd be an income coming into our communities via hotels, restaurants and local services. In addition to this, there'd be an economic boost via taxes. It would also continue the push for economic revival of our working harbour by bringing in the components of the wind turbine. Those industry professionals have identified that this is the time and Humboldt County is the place. To close, I'd like to share that in light of recent years public safety power shutoffs, it heightened the need for locally produced energy. We heard the discussion around whether that's the right or wrong thing to do. But this would contribute to the goals and move towards the lack of reliance on fossil fuels. The Chamber does um, support clean energy and believe that there's no better time than now. Oh, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. Marco, would love to come to you next. You could find your way to your video and unmute yourself. The question we have is developing offshore wind at the medium or large scale will require upgrades to the transmission system in the North Coast. Beyond enabling the export of electricity from offshore wind farms, what benefits could improvements to the transmission infrastructure bring to the region? Thank you. And first of all, I would like to start by saying um, Thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Very happy to be here. Um, in terms of the question, obviously we will have to see what the ultimate plan of service will be for any offshore wind generation. Uh, but one thing we do know, uh, and Mark mentioned these and others, um, uh, the studies and what we know of the system is that whether we develop medium or large scale generation, they will, they will, uh, it will require significant upgrades to the local transmission system. And that really is because the, the, the current grid um, in this region was not designed to export uh, generation really um, to the outside of the area. So in general, what we found is that there are two possible ways to interconnect this generation at, at these two levels that we're talking about. And uh, for the medium scale, uh, we think that adding capacity and expanding the existing system is a possibility that could work. Uh, and then for the larger scale building uh, high voltage transmission lines to interconnect, you know, close to 2000 megawatts of generation to the bulk electric grid in Central California will work best. But under either scenario, the, the, we think that the local Humboldt and North Coast area transmission system could definitely benefit from, from such upgrades to the infrastructure. So if we take the medium um, scale uh, first, um, just to get into a little more details, um, if we were to upgrade the existing system with higher capacity conductors, and, and if we do build a couple of the new 115 KB lines that we mentioned earlier, uh, so that we could uh, export the generation when, 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 when we're not using it, then I think those upgrades would make the humble area uh, much more, much more reliable. Um, they just thinking about upgrading the lines and substations we will get um, increased capacity and we will not have to worry about serving any load uh, increase in this, in this region. Um, then if we add the new 115 KB lines, um, those will provide additional redundancy and, and diversity and interconnection to the main electric grid. Not only would we have access to the generation that we're discussing, but also just uh, better access to the grid, um, especially during winter storm conditions when the transmission, when transmission could experience more outages, or even and during other times, um, if we have more uh, severe events, um, you know those benefits will also expand or extend southwards of uh, Humboldt um, and regions like Garberville, Laytonville, uh, and just the Mendocino area overall. Uh, we would have to build a new 115 KB line uh, going south into that area, and so that area would also. I, you know, we'll see their, their reliability improve drastically because currently the system designed there is uh, long transmission lines and 
and it's just in and out, uh, there isn't a lot of redundancy. So having a new 115 KV line would definitely uh, help there. Um, and so for just thinking about the larger scale generation, uh, which will require to build high voltage um, interconnection facilities, and we're thinking 500 KV lines, currently the Humboldt region doesn't have those. Uh, and so these will have to be uh, built you know, from uh, greenfield, just from scratch. And, and we're thinking of these more as uh, highways you know, to transport the electricity, uh, but there's still opportunity for this uh, new infrastructure to, to support the area. And one of the ways that that could happen is if, if we design the, the substation that will be built for the interconnection of the generation, if we could size it large enough with enough real estate so that we could add lower voltage facilities there so that then we could, uh, the local region could also benefit from having uh, that generation and that new substation there. So again, just having these, uh, it will be, um, it will help with the future load growth in the area and then support the region, you know, during, during specific times of need. Fantastic, thank you, Marco. Okay, last but certainly not least, I um, would love to hear from Neil. And Neil, the question we have for you is the development of transmission capacity is necessary to facilitate the deployment of offshore wind to the North Coast. What is the process for developing transmission capacity at the scale needed for medium and large scale wind farms? Thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just start with a bit of background on um, the process I work on, uh, and Matthew touched on it actually. So the integrated resource planning process um, is, um, we involves working with um, some of the, the, the California Public, Public Utilities Commission um, and the staff there, we work with utilities, community choice aggregators like Redwood Coast Energy Authority, um, stakeholder groups to, to really try and seek to identify the, the long-term um, electricity resource needs for the state based on its objectives. Um, so integrated, um, our process, that, that's got kind of two meanings to me, integrated in the sense of um, when we're comparing different energy options from wind farms to solar farms, batteries, um, maybe existing use of gas, energy efficiency or, or rooftop solar, um, comparing them in an apples for apples fashion. Uh, and then we also talk about integrated in the sense that just like um, Matthew's organization has just put forward a, a plan, um, they've just done that along with about 40 or so other energy provider, providers up and down the state. And so the planning process uh, we facilitate attempts to integrate um, those planning efforts in a way um, that's optimal for ratepayers. So then, so back to considering transmission uh, and expansion that, that might be needed for offshore wind. Um, I, I guess the two, two sort of broad ways um, such transmission can get funded, one being um, specific to a single generator, the other being where it's more involving shared infrastructure. And so um, in the first case, um, you know, typically the costs um, and the, the infrastructure associated with a single generator getting access to the transmission system to deliver their service and they bear the upfront costs. Um, whereas if uh, there are multiple generators um, uh, providing service um, and then, you know, multiple uh, parts of the system benefiting, um, you know, you have a shared infrastructure opportunity there and an opportunity to, to share the costs of that um, from the start across um, ratepayers that are bearing, you know, benefiting from that. So um, the integrated resource planning process we facilitate is designed to look, look for those opportunities. Um, you know, I think, because, and, and it's clear from, um, you know, Arnie's presentation and, and, um, and Mark, and, and what Mark was just saying as well, that for, you know, offshore wind is likely to be a, a very much a shared, provide a shared benefit. Um, there's the opportunity to, to, to supply the state broadly, not just um, the local area. Um, and so, so from, um, so to explore the transmission for that, um, we, we've got uh, sort of, I guess, three particularly relevant activities going on in integrated resource planning at the moment. One, um, Nessie from BOEM mentioned at the outset that um, we, that the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, uh, are currently uh, working on um, ac ac tr really trying to update the cost estimates um, for offshore wind specific to California. Um, so that will build on the estimates that Arnie used 
um, and, and that we've already used in our modeling so far. Um, offshore wind was introduced in, into statewide modeling a year ago um, as, a, as a new resource. Um, and so we want to build on um, making sure we've got the best assumptions possible, um, have stakeholders understand those. And, and so that NRO report um, funded by BOEM, coming, uh, it's, it's out for peer review at the moment. That's going to be really important. Um, and then on the transmission capacity side, we're seeking to improve the assumptions there. Um, so what capacity is available in the system already for offshore wind, um, both uh, on the north coast as well as central coast, uh, and what, what cost assumptions to use to expand that if, if needed. Um, and then thirdly, um, procurement and in investment and how to actually have such a large or complex resource um, come to fruition. That, that's an activity that um, the CPUC um, is exploring with stakeholders um, in what we're calling the procurement track. So that's um, not just offshore wind, but um, perhaps um, wind from out of state that comes, on, comes in on new transmission lines to California, large geothermal projects, uh, long duration storage projects. Um, so that exercise is, is aiming to um, work through how to actually make that investment occur. Um, so I covered a lot there, but um, I can I pause now and, and thanks very much to the Schatz Energy Research Center for including me today. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. So thank you to all of our panelists. Um, wonderful to hear your initial remarks. And then we hope to continue to have this kind of back and forth with the panelists and hear from our presenter, or sorry, from our participants what some of their additional questions might be. So I'm just going to move over um, and segue into the community discussion. We will just screen share. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so as part of our community discussion, um, we're trying to move away from, you know, all of this wonderful sharing out of information that has happened um, in an effort to increase understanding and knowledge of the offshore wind technology and start to move to hear from all of you who've so patiently been a part of our webinar and of course submitting questions for the Q&A um, and through email. So the SHOT Center, OPC, our presenters, our panelists, everyone is eager to hear from you about your perspectives, your insights, your follow-up questions um, to some of the panelists' questions, and your concerns related to the information that's been shared. We do have, as we saw in the poll, um, a good balance of local and non-local um, community members on the webinar today, and we have folks with diverse expertise and experience related to offshore wind somehow. So we'll continue this discussion in this format, again, kind of this back and forth um, between participants and panelists, and hope to hear a, a variety of perspectives and questions from all of you. So as we've been doing, we continue to invite you to share your questions and comments via the Q&A box or the email. And now, if you would like to ask a question um, yourself, you have the ability to raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand button. And on our end, we'll get a queue going of names um, and folks will, we will open up your line in the order that your hand was raised. And so just as a reminder, we'll be oscillating so that we can take questions from a variety of formats. We'll be taking them from the Q&A, then I'll see if there's any from the email, and then we'll go to the raise hand. So thank you for your patience as we try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, and again, a reminder that we, we are capturing all questions and there will be that subsequent FAQ document um, where we will address the frequently asked questions, even if we don't get to say them out loud today. A last reminder before I stop talking, um, for folks that are joining us on the phone um, in the listen only mode, without access to screen share, we do invite you to submit your um, questions via email, which can be helpful if you're on a smartphone. Again, that email and for everybody else is windstudies at shopcenter.org. Okay, so now I'm going to stop sharing the community discussion. And I'm going to allow us to see the panel view of everybody and start taking the questions. Okay, so a question to Jason from Christy. Do you foresee the jobs developed truly being local or outsourced? 
many large construction projects in Humboldt have been outsourced in the past? Yeah, I think that's a question that we have also. I think that's a question yet to be determined on what it looks like on the rollout. I would hope that, um, you know, some of our other uh, projects here in Blue Lake, we use uh, mainly local uh, contractors, but some of that, um, you know, I have to believe that during a large deployment that uh, the ex not everybody has the expertise here to be able, you know, to do that. So there'd probably be a, a number of people from out of the area and really what I was speaking to is that, you know, number one, you want to try to have as much local uh, local contractors as you can, local engineers as you can. The biggest uh, participation from the university when it comes to uh, research uh, with uh, RCEA, those groups doing research, doing research projects. And so that, you know, with the hope that at the end of the day, that there's some jobs stick around and there's some, there's some long-term benefit for folks here. Yeah, I guess I'd just like to add a follow up to that real quick in, in that there's sort of two angles to that. There's the, if we do a local project, what are the job benefits? And, you know, and I think as we just said, yeah, the, the, that's going to, that's going to vary. And, and certainly at the smaller scale, a lot of those broader jobs are not going to be local. I mean, just be realistic, you know, we, we're not going to have a, a blade manufacturing plant to build 10 turbines in Humboldt County. So those are going to be brought from somewhere else. So it's going to be, you know, more of the assembly or operation and maintenance jobs. But I think something from a Humboldt County standpoint for the local folks is that Humboldt Bay actually has a lot of potential to be a, a hub for this um, industry, not just for local projects, but for projects in other parts of California or other, you know, uh, West Coast or Pacific projects. And so I, I think regardless of kind of the full sort of future build out scale of a Humboldt County project or multiple projects in the area, um, we could position the, the, the harbor as being a hub uh, in, in more of a regional, you know, uh, capacity. So I think there's a lot of potential um, more for the industry, if anything, than just looking specifically at what would be the construction jobs for a Humboldt County project. Fantastic. Thank you, Jason and Matthew. Um, there's a follow-up to this question. Do you want to talk about all the commitments you might be hoping to see from an offshore wind developer towards addressing income gaps here on the North Coast? Can I I'm sorry, yeah. Jason, thank you. Could you repeat that question for me? Sure. Would you like to talk about all the commitments you might be hoping to see from an offshore wind developer toward addressing income gaps here on the North Coast? Addressing income gaps? Um, look, I'm not sure I'm the person, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm actually the right person for that, for this, you know, it's probably a broader discussion, but, you know, my point uh, is, look, you, you'd hope that in a place that has large, you know, uh, much larger both uh, poverty rate, median income is only 58% of what the, the state's median income is, that three times the number of homeless folks, that we, there would be some economic opportunity to provide folks with jobs so that we could have healthy families and a healthy community. That's really, that's really where I was coming from with uh, my statements. You know, some of the other per particulars of what I would expect, you, you'd try to hope that, you know, that through port development and some infrastructure development that some that a lot of local people have other opportunities that it would be a tremendous investment from whatever companies that were to come in that there would be other research opportunities that all those things would add to you know a, a generally uh, positive uh, economic situation where I guess under the deployment of one of the large the larger version I mean you'd really see that I would hope to see that as like a cornerstone industry where we'd have people doing operation and maintenance, those jobs would last a long time, there'd be other opportunities in, in ecotourism, all of those things adding to something here that, that where, you, where I see and I look around, not, there's not really too tremendous you know, positive eco, economic news. So uh, I guess that's probably how I answer that question. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I guess I could I could jump in on, on that one as well, just with a little bit. And that we 
we, we've seen little drips of, of uh, job creation already in the sense that, you know, the partners that we're working with, um, you know, Ocker Solutions, Principal Power and EPR actually have hired some, uh, you know, local interns and, and, and those folks, you know, one was uh, in the Coast Guard and then is going back to school for to study, you know, renewable energy and he got an opportunity to, to work with Ocker Solutions who develops floating sea structures and, and is really on the technical side of it and actually got to go to, to Europe and, and, you know, learn some of the, the technological aspects of, of this kind of a um, project and development pathway. And, and so I, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to already see a little bit of that. And that's obviously like three jobs. So it's not, you know, some big economic um, movement, but I think one of the, the benefits of the slow timeline of this in the sense that we're looking at, you know, four or five, six years before we're really going to get into to full swing, that gives us some time to build up some local capacity to do this kind of work. Because, you know, there, there's no offshore floating wind foundation technicians in Humboldt County right now. So, you know, if, if we want to have, you know, local uh, workforce development, there, you know, there's going to have to be a ramp up there. But, you know, the, the good news is that the, the slower timeline to get to where we want to be is going to provide an opportunity to work with local labor unions and, and work with, um, you know, possible developers and, and supply chain folks. To, to try to, to the greatest extent we can, um, you know, fill those roles with, with local folks and provide training. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's still, you know, it's a challenge, but I think it's something that, that we can really focus on of, of not just having it be um, sort of the indirect benefits of people coming into the area, which is still good for the economy, but it's better if we can train the local workforce to fill those roles and, and we've got some time to, you know, send them off for these kinds of internships so they can go and learn in real world environments and then come back and do the work here in Humboldt. Sounds thoughtful. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, we have a question for Nessie from Tyler. Nessie, are you able to share more information about the specifics of the analysis that will be conducted under the new BOEM funding that you mentioned by BOEM during your introductions. Um, this is Nessie, and I could defer that to Arnie, but basically it's just trying to um, understand, I mean, there's offshore, there's wind resource potential um, model data that has been generated recently. And so one of the, the tasks would be to update the, the work that's been completed uh, with that newer data, and um, then to look at um, potential mitigation measures that could help to look at uh, small commercial scale that might be um, doable given um, transmission constraints um, and, and cost. And I invite Arnie to expand on that. Um, thank you, Nessie, and um, thanks for the question, uh, Tyler. Um, uh, for the, the first part of the analysis, which is up, upgrading our analysis to use the, the latest uh, wind data, I don't really have anything to add there. But um, in terms of the, the um, transmission analysis, um, what we're essentially looking to do there is for um, uh, small scale commercial uh, projects, sort of maybe on the order of, of um, uh, up to a few hundred megawatts uh, in scale, uh, but possibly smaller. Um, trying to understand what are the, um, basically value engineering the, the um, transmission possibilities there to, to see if uh, scenarios that include some degree of, of storage or um, some degree of curtailment on the side of the wind farm at strategic moments can result in a, uh, a situation where the transmission requirements are uh, are not quite so costly. So trying to find that optimal point or that optimal balance between um, uh, investment in transmission versus investment in storage um, and or strategic use of curtailment uh, so that the transmission costs can be, um, can be reduced. And so the, we'll be looking at a, a variety of, of scenarios um, uh, in, in that arena with the idea that um, if offshore wind is to proceed uh, in this area, it seems most likely that uh, it would start with a, a modest scale project. Um, and um, uh, one of the key barriers to proceeding is, is um, transmission and trying to 
uh, make that transmission cost be as as affordable as as possible. Uh, and so we're just trying to understand the, the what's possible in that in that uh, in that regard. Thanks, Nasty and Arnie. Um, our next question is also to you, Arnie, so don't go too far, from Larry. Can HSU apply for and receive an offshore research area to deploy and study new and emerging marine energy technologies off Humboldt? Um, so BOEM does have a research lease uh, process, uh, and so there is a, there is a, um, a possibility of applying for a research lease. HSU wouldn't be the applicant. My understanding is that um, uh, uh, yeah, a state agency or, or the state of California or a federal agency would need to be the, the primary applicant, but um, HSU or another entity could be uh, centrally involved in, in such an endeavor. Um, so certainly that is a, a, a possibility. There have been uh, uh, some discussions about uh, about whether or not that uh, could be something that's useful to uh, to pursue. Currently, um, Bohm has pursued a, or what Bohm has open is a is a commercial leasing process, um, and uh, and so that's what's currently currently in play. Fantastic, thank you, Arnie. Um, just a note that we're getting lots of questions in from the Q&A. Um, haven't seen any hand raising yet, so that's fine to proceed as is. Just wanted to let you folks know that you have the opportunity to raise your hand and ask your question yourself. So we will move forward with the next question um, from the chat. This is directed to Mark from Scott. Is a subsea transmission line down the coast feasible from an environmental and economic standpoint? Hi, Scott, and thanks. That's a good question. Um, our assessment looked primarily at technical feasibility, and there's many challenges um, in both. Like, there's two corridors that we identified. They're both very challenging for different reasons. Um, the corridor that's closer to shore is extremely challenging from an environmental permitting perspective. And while we tried to identify the most uh, feasible option, it still would be quite difficult. And that's probably the major or the most challenging barrier in that uh, standpoint. And then, <clears throat> so I think environmental, it's an, it's an open question because we didn't really conduct that assessment in full, but it's more about looking at the specific requirements for all of the different um, state marine protected areas and then federal marine protected areas as well. From an economic standpoint, um, the costs are only slightly more expensive than overland transmission cables, and there could be potential benefits for interconnecting directly into the San Francisco Bay Area. So I think that from an economic perspective, at least from our initial estimates, it seems to be less challenging, and it's more on the technical and environmental feasibility side. Thank you, Mark. Okay, our next question um, is not directed to anyone. Um, so welcome, it looks like based on the question, Arnie, Mark, Marco, or Neil might be appropriate or all of you can help the tag team. Um, the question is from Colin, would it be possible to build larger, for example, 500 kilovolt transmission lines within or partially within the footprint of existing transmission lines or would they require completely new easements with attendant environmental impacts? So I could start from, from the design perspective and then uh, maybe uh, we could get into the permitting. But from the design perspective, I, I, I think it, 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 will be, it will be difficult to use the same right away. I think, you know, those 500 kV transmission towers, as Mark showed on, on those pictures, they're so, they're so huge and they're so tall. They require their own right of ways and, 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 and land basically. Uh, there might be other requirements, uh, you know, from a safety perspective where you want to have them separated. Um, and then at least within the PG&E territory, um, those 500 kV lines, um, at least what I've seen is we don't co-locate those with lower transmission lines. So they're pretty much on their own. And so I, I would think it would be a little difficult, um, you know, to try to co-locate things. I, I think they will need their own permit. I, I think that addresses the question. 
okay. I would have said something Perfect. similar. Thank you, Marco and Arnie. Okay, we have a question um, for both Mark and Marco. So maybe we'll start with Mark. Um, the question is from Robert. I can't tell from the map and let us know if it's helpful to um, pull back up the slide. I can't tell from the map the exact route of your north to south transmission alternative two. Did you evaluate possible transmission in the Eel River rail right of way, such as underneath or alongside the new rail trail? I understand there has been concern about subsoil instability, i.e. landslides on that route. Has the rail trail transmission option undergone geotechnical analysis that would disqualify it altogether? Mark, let us know if you need us to pull up that slide to address this. I think that's fine. And I, I guess I'll, for, for everyone's sake, I'll just uh, reiterate that um, that question's referring to, there were, there were for this large scale development, two overland transmission corridors. One was heading from Humboldt east to the Redding area and then south um, down the Central Valley. And the second one was just kind of connecting from Humboldt down to, yeah, that's exactly where, down to a substation called Vaca Dixon, which is a, a centrally located substa substation that has good uh, high voltage transmission capacity. Um, and our analysis there, for some of the reasons Marco just mentioned in his previous analysis, did not take into account the specific right of way um, that it would need to follow. It was more just focused on what are the hubs that it needs to connect to. So what are the um, substations that it needs to um, tie in through. There's a lot of challenges with identifying a suitable right of way um, over land um, if these uh, upgrades can't be built within the existing right of way. So that identification process I think would actually be quite challenging, but it wasn't um, taken up as, as part of this study directly. So um, I can't really speak to, the, to that specific um, right of way idea. Yeah, and this is Marco. I just want to echo that. I, uh, I think the um, the general objective of 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 the study was to evaluate the different interconnection points and then understand what the limitations or impacts to the rest of the grid will be. It, it really didn't look at at, at um, routings. Uh, we kind of figured those, you know, whatever whichever way we go, those will be addressed as you know as part of the permitting process and all that stuff. So at this point, it was just technical analysis to understand the impact to the system. Thank you both. Okay, we have a question for Neil. Could you please expand a bit more about the next steps and the potential timeline for transmission line development on the North Coast? Thanks, I'll try. I think, um, I think the, the, as in terms of the the detail, like the, the particular lines that are considered and that were explored in the PG&E um, analysis that Mark presented. Um, I think Mark and Marco will be, um, will know more than me, but um, from a general sense, um, you know, I think my, my understanding is a transmission line can take um, from inception to, to, to providing service can take 10 years to get through um, securing the site, um, permitting, um, and then construction. Um, and so maybe I can just contribute from a, a statewide planning perspective. Um, the integrated resource planning process that I talked about um, interfaces with the transmission planning process, which goes into detailed studies of each um, transmission project, like, like potentially a North Coast um, of, uh, offshore wind transmission line. And um, the the, the, every year, the, the integrated resource planning process provides um, a future resource portfolio for study uh, into that transmission planning process. Um, so every year, there are the potential for new um, projects to be identified as being important to policy needs in the future. By policy needs, I mean like to meet states' uh, environmental and other objectives. Um, uh, and so. But I suppose from an offshore wind perspective, given it's just a new resource in the planning process, it was only started modeling last year. Um, I, think it's, it, I think it's in the order of say three to four years before um, a resource can be identified, like that resource can be identified as um, 
you know, fairly certain of being important to the 2030 or so timeframe needs of the state and then um, be studied in transmission um, to, to result in a project being identified as um, ready to approve. Now that can happen in parallel with, with the, 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 the permitting and the, the, you know, the design engineering and construction of a line. Um, so I, I hope that helps. So that was quite a, a general, uh, the general timeframe. Thank you, Neil. A question from Sarah to Arnie. Has there been much research into hydrogen electrolysis using the curtailed energy from the larger scale offshore wind farms off the coast of California and using that hydrogen to supplement base load power? Have you considered making hydrogen with the excess wind energy? Um, so that's not something that we covered in the current analysis, but it is um, both uh, using um, battery storage and um, uh, thinking about hydrogen as a potential use of the energy are things that um, uh, I think uh, could be valuable to touch on in, in future work. Uh, and so that is something that we have uh, spent a little bit of time uh, thinking about at a pre preliminary level. Um, I'm not sure that you would want to use, um, you would want to use electricity to generate hydrogen and then to use that hydrogen as a, um, as a storage medium for electricity, just because the efficiency of going from electricity to hydrogen and back to electricity is, is not very high compared to battery storage. Um, but I think that there could be interesting um, applications of hydrogen for other, other things, such as as a transportation fuel, uh, that, that might be more economically uh, um, uh, beneficial. And so I think that those are questions that are, are very much worth exploring. Yeah, I can just add, Sarah and, and Ani, that um, at a statewide level, there is modelling um, that's been done recently and as part of the Senate Bill 100 uh, report process, which is occurring at the moment. Um, there was a presentation last week um, uh, publicly about the, the modelling of that, and it does try and um, assess a high hydrogen scenario. So what if in 2045, electricity load was partly used to, for electrolysis to create hydrogen? Um, so the, the results of that might be interesting um, to, to explore. Yep. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Okay, a question to Marco. Would upgrades to the transmission conductors occur after a power purchase agreement with an offshore wind developer? Sorry, let me, would upgrades to the transmission and or conductors occur after a power purchase agreement with an offshore wind developer is signed? Or is there an earlier point at which PG&E would begin increasing capacity? That's a really good question. Um, I guess the way I would answer that is um, definitely have to work with, with the CPUC and, and, and also the California ISO. Um, we've mentioned about, uh, Neil has talked about the, um, uh, the transmission planning process. So I think if this becomes uh, a goal that the state has and the CAISO and the California ISO has that as part of the portfolio and assumptions, uh, um, you know, it's possible that before any contracts are signed. And again, we have to go through that process, but it is possible that if, if these areas are identified as something that needs to be developed, that probably if there's a policy mandate, you know, there's probably some, or possibly that will be the one way to get started sooner, I think. Um, so it's, it's just leveraging that process, I think. And so I, I see Neil, I don't know if you wanna chime in a little more today. Yeah, I think that's what you said, um, Marco, is, is it, you know, it's a chicken or the egg problem. Um, so for everyone involved in planning, um, we want to make sure infrastructure is built and it gets used. But um, so, you know, having commercial interest demonstrated is a great way of identifying that. But on the other hand, that commercial interest needs um, some certainty that the infrastructure will be there. So, um, yeah, as Marco described, the, the planning process aims to try and you know, close, short circuit that, um, that chicken or egg issue. Thank you both. Uh, we have a question from, sorry, to Jason from Nancy. 
I am wondering how broadly shared your generally positive outlook is within the Northern California tribal communities. I think I answered that just briefly online. I, you know, I get the sense that, you know, tribes here, they're concerned about their cultural resources for sure. They're concerned that, you know, they see themselves, we see ourselves as, you know, um, being the original protectors of our own lands and that we're concerned about climate change. Um, but we're also really concerned about cultural resources and what this project might bring if, to access and protection of those resources. So I certainly don't speak for every tribe. and I don't want anybody on the panel or anybody on the call to assume that this is the tribal perspective uh, in this region, you know, uh, period. This is just, I speak only for the Blue Lake Rancheria, but my sense is both of those things that are important to tribes that climate change is really important and protection of their cultural resources and access to those resources is really important. Perfect, thank you. A uh, question from Daniel to Matthew. Would offshore wind allow you to cancel or upgrade gasification or torrefaction, excuse my pronunciation, of mill waste biomass energy? Yeah, the I think the, the the short answer is probably probably not, or or at least they're not related to each other. I mean, there's there's a certain amount of, um, you know, maybe you could say a little bit in the sense that you know, if the more there's other local generation resources, um, you know, the, the less there's going to be reliance on the the current existing resources, which are the the natural gas power plant, and um, and the biomass plants, you know, if if we see wind come online, the, the first thing it would probably displace would be um, natural gas and and or um, imports, which was reflected, I think, in in some of the graphs that were shown earlier. In, in the sense that the the profile and the the generation is sort of different of different resources, you know. So when you look at solar, it's it's not constant, but it's fairly you know reliable, and that the sun comes up every morning and it goes down every morning. Um, at least, you know, so far, 2020 is off to a pretty bad first half, so maybe we shouldn't count on that. Um, but, um, you know, you, you can say, hey, at one o'clock in the morning, there's not going to be solar resource. You can plan around that. Um, you know, you, you look at natural gas and it's very flexible. It can ramp up, it can ramp down, you know, as far as our, our local plant. And so it actually has a lot of flexibility. The downside is obviously that it's based off of fossil resources. Um, and you know biomass is in the category of it's very consistent it can run 24 7 it's you know it's on all the time it, it isn't really designed to ramp up and down um and then wind is in the category of it has a you know a very good capacity factor and on an average basis it complements solar really well in the sense that um if you look at you know the average generation of wind compared to you know your daily solar output it, it's a nice it's a nice balance you know the wind often picks up in the evening um, but but the the challenge with wind is it it's you know sometimes it's you know very very windy sometimes it's it's you know there's no wind at all and it's still and so you know you have to work around that much more um, wide range of variability of wind and that's where you know the, the 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 ability for the natural gas plant is great that it can it can ramp up and down um, to potentially accommodate you know when there's lots of wind or when there's no wind. You know, more likely the biomass plants are going to kind of be chugging along at that base load capacity because wind doesn't have that sort of 24-7 uh, consistency. Um, so, you know, I, I, they're not really interchangeable from a resource planning standpoint. So I think there's there's lots of questions around biomass, which is not what we're talking about. But, um, you know, the, the, they're, they're, they're sort of different in their profiles in, in many ways. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question for Karen. In your view, what are important next steps for exploring the potential to develop offshore wind? And how does this resource fit into California's clean energy and climate mitigation plan? Well, I'm not going to risk video, but I am here and happy to provide an answer. Um, you know, this work that the Shots Energy Center is doing is a really important step for us in not only helping better understand the transmission side of the equation, but also the dialogue that the Scott Energy Center is fostering, including right now. And, and so we appreciate that. We have work to do 
in California in terms of questions about um, how we can overcome obstacles that we see, you know, both on the North Coast and on the Central Coast to, um, to find the potential or to realize the potential of offshore wind. At the same time, the SB100 process and the um, energy work that the state agencies are doing right now are also a really important point in um, helping us understand the options and choices and trade-offs in front of us as we move to meet our goals. Fabulous, thank you, Karen. A question for Nessie from Sarah. Nessie, how has COVID-19 impacted the BOEM regulatory timeline and leasing process? Is there any effort to speed up the regulatory process in hopes of getting more offshore wind projects off the ground? Um, well, I guess it, it, you know, COVID has impacted our process in the same way it has impacted most, you know, like for instance, today we would all be in the North Coast instead of a virtual session. So I think we're just trying to do what we can. Um, I mean, in as much as even on the Central Coast, we, we did a virtual um, webinar for the, for the task, well, our last task force was a, a, a virtual and we tried to do a visual too, you know, try and show try to describe the visual impacts on a virtual platform. It's kind of difficult, but I think we're just, you know, trying to, to move the process as best we can and, and doing what we can. And hopefully soon um, we can be at the coast um, talking to stakeholders and, and getting, um, you know, more one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face meetings. But, um, you know, we're, we're, at this point, we're, we're just doing what we can. Thank you, Nessie. Um, a question to Neil. Could there be scaling up opportunities with wind projects on the south coast of Oregon? Um, Neil, you are on. Uh, you okay, yeah, good question. I think, um, you know, like, I, I can't speak particularly to the south coast Oregon resort, uh, resource, but, um, you know, in addition to the, the call area, call area that, um, the Schatz group studied the, um, there are well there are a couple other you know prospective resource areas in the north coast so I guess not far from Oregon um, you know off Del, Nol Del Norte and then um, Cape Mendocino and um, I think I think your question um, could goes to you know is there merit in um, aggregating those along with um, Humboldt to, in order to spread the costs of um, the transmission and other shared costs. And, you know, I think that's, some, that's an important question to explore. Thank you, Neil. A uh, question to Mark from Dixon. Did you look at infrastructure needs for the maritime industry to manage both construction, operation, and response to mechanical casualties? Thanks, that's a good question. I think um, this question is mainly referring to um, port infrastructure, operations and maintenance infrastructure, and service vessels that can maintain and operate this equipment, both on sh offshore and, and bringing back the equipment to shore um, if needed for servicing. And yes, that is considered. And um, we actually have a, a whole separate webinar that's gonna be focused on that and the engineers, the, the kind of coastal planning and, and uh, uh, port engineers that studied that will be presenting uh, that information there. Um, the place where it was incorporated into the results I presented today was was the cost. So um, when we're looking at what are the what's the economic viability for a, a 50 or 150 megawatt wind farm that has one set of uh, port infrastructure and operation and maintenance costs associated with it um, that are different than the large scale. Um, port infrastructure that we're looking at. So um, <clears throat> on the small scale, it's assumed that Humboldt um, Bay and the port, like a port facility would be developed to assemble and operate and maintain the equipment. Um, but in the large scale deployment, it's a, just because uh, it's a much more complicated process to get so many um, turbines out to the water. It's assumed that um, a little bit of the fabrication 
in addition to the assembly and operations and maintenance activities would occur in the port. So the costs are, are a little bit higher there, but it also um, means that there's probably a higher fraction of those jobs that would be um, local versus elsewhere in the state. Thank you, Mark. A question for Marco from David. When will the Humboldt gas fired plants be due for decommissioning and does the reduced power generation extend the life of the plants? And it looks like David has referred to slide seven um, potentially from Mark's presentation. So we could always pull that up as that's helpful. Um, so I, you know, I, I guess I'm not prepared to speak about when it will be decommissioned, the, the power plant. I think, uh, you know, currently the area is relying on it, you know, to, to be able to serve the, the local power needs. Um, if, if, if offshore wind does develop and, you know, I, I don't know if that becomes an economic uh, question for, for PG&E or, but I, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm not really sure uh, what, what this would do. Um, I think the slide just really simply refers to, you know, just the, the, the higher usage of the offshore wind versus the, the humble uh, power plant. Thank you, Marco. Um, a question for Arnie from Andy. Are the turbines visible from land? Are they tsunami proof? Um, so, uh, um, in the scenarios that we looked at, which would be about a, a, a using 12 megawatt turbines, which would be about 450 feet tall to the to the hub, um, if they were in the call area, they would um, they would be visible from land it, at some locations. They would be pretty small on the horizon, so they wouldn't uh, uh, they wouldn't be visible on many days. Certainly, we know how our, our coast looks, so there's lots of days when you wouldn't be able to see them, but um, there would be times when you would be able to see them at, from certain locations, um, but they would be pretty small on the on the horizon. Um, and uh, in the um, third webinar, I believe uh, we can show some um, uh, simulations that show uh, sh show what that might look like. Um, uh, in terms of them being tsunami proof um, in the next webinar on the 21st um, next week, um, part of the topic that we'll, we'll cover is um, geologic and seismic hazards. And so we'll cover that in, in greater detail there. I think the very short story is that um, the wind farm itself, I think would not be um, particularly susceptible to a tsunami because it's far enough from shore that the wave is, is quite small there, but the onshore infrastructure of course, just like any of the infrastructure that we have here on shore, uh, tsunami hazards would have to be uh, considered. Thank you, Arnie. Um, we have a question that's addressed to all panelists. Um, so we'll start with asking Matthew to take a, um, a first response and then invite other panelists to tag team and build upon his response. The question is, could you please discuss how offshore wind coordinates the goals of RCEA's comprehensive action plan for energy? And this was asked earlier when we thought that you might be the most appropriate person to address during this time. You may be on mute. Matthew, if you'd like to respond, let us know if you're needing help to unmute yourself. Hey, okay. can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, sorry, I lost, I lost my internet connection, which is one of the, the joys of being in rural Humboldt County. Uh, I'm on my cell phone, so I can't see you all, but I hopefully, <laughs> I can hear you all. You're coming through loud um, and clear. Could you repeat Let's the question real forward. quickly? Sorry about that. Sure. Could you please discuss how offshore wind coordinates the goals of RCEA's comprehensive action plan for energy? Yeah. So, so I, I think I alluded to this a little bit in my comments, but um, you know, our, our goals are really around developing local renewable resources. And when you look at, you know, um, 
total capacity offshore wind is really the, the the largest untapped potential, you know, both both locally and as was noted at a at a, a state level. And you know, I always try to remind myself that California is whatever the fifth biggest economy in the world. Um, so you know, a percentage of California's energy needs is is no trivial thing. Um, so I, I think you know it really fits in with those big picture, you know, overall objectives. And I think you know to to the the point that I, I, I kind of touched on previously. You know, when we're looking at trying to meet both our local energy needs as well as the state energy needs, you know, having a diverse portfolio of generation sources is going to be key to getting off of fossil fuels. You know, so solar is is already becoming a huge piece of the the puzzle. Um, you know, storage resources can help. Um, you know, uh, really. Uh, provide flexibility, but but we're we're really going to want to have you know that that full sort of ecosystem of different sources you know from from you know sustainable hydroelectric to to solar to to wind on and offshore, um, you know biomass certainly has a role right now and you know and and there's there's a lot of different uh, geothermal you know and, and really kind of trying to 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 put all those things together I think is going to be key to to getting to you know, a, a non-fossil fuel future. Um, and, and I think that's where our offshore wind, really, when you look at California, is is both for our local portfolio as well as the state portfolio, really um, one of the biggest untapped opportunities we have. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so I know I said others can pile on. Welcome that if that's the case. Matthew seemed to address it quite thoroughly. So I will proceed to the next question. Um, there's a question from Mark from Andrea. Have you ever had a chance to calculate a capacity factor for the Morro Bay area site, given their lower wind reliability and speed, and assuming you could get military approval? This would allow comparison of the larger generation potential from Humboldt versus the better and less expensive connection to load centers and transmission connectivity further down the coast. Andrea, that's a really good question, and unfortunately, that comparison was just outside the scope of what were what we were contracted to do. Um, we were focused specifically on the North Coast region and kind of making comparisons within this region rather than comparing it to uh, the Central Coast. But it is a, a interesting question. The uh, capacity factor on the Central Coast would undoubtedly be a little bit lower just because of their wind speed resources. Um, not quite as consistent and not quite as uh, strong, um, but there's a lot of advantages to that region despite the military, uh, potential military conflict because interconnection could be um, at a lower cost because there's uh, additional transmission capacity from the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. So making that comparison is probably a good one, but it might be something that's more suitable to developers who are interested or considering creating nominations or, or um, participating in lease auctions for either the Humboldt region or the Central Coast region. So um, I'm sure someone else has maybe done that calculation as a back of the envelope as part of their uh, uh, business priorities. Thanks, Mark. So we're about 10 minutes out from moving into the final agenda item, next steps and participant feedback. We still have a queue of questions that I'm gonna to turn to in just a moment. I just wanted to check in with Arnie to see if there are any groups of folks that we haven't heard from and that you would like to invite specifically to, to speak up and, and, and welcome their participation. Um, I think we can just continue with the questions as is. It seems like we've gotten questions from a diverse set of, of participants. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so this question um, is for Mark or Arnie from Archie. Uh, looks like it's come, up, come in from the email. Um, Archie is joining us on the phone. So that's great. There's an operative offshore wind electric generation farm in Scotland and another in Portugal. In terms of physical factors, how different is our local situation from those? How much does that impact our timeline in getting installation started? Uh, personal note, I'm in my 90s. It would be nice to see physical action start before I croak. I'm assuming that was okay to read out loud since it was typed into the to the Q&A. Uh, Mark, do you want to go or, or should I? 
sure, I, I can take a first stab and then maybe you can just add on. Um, the wind farm in Scotland, I think the one different, so there's two major components to an offshore wind farm. There's the turbine, there's the floating platform, and there is a whole range of auxiliary components that make connection between there and the electricity grid. If we just think about the two primary components, the turbine and the floating substructure, the turbines that have been tested both in Portugal and offshore Scotland are very similar, if not identical to turbines that would be installed offshore Humboldt County. Humboldt County may be, they could be larger depending on where the industry is at the date of installation, but they're essentially the same technology. The platforms that were deployed off Portugal, I believe this was a testing um, or like a demonstration project done through principal power and they use a floating substructure that is likely very similar to what would be installed in Humboldt. Uh, these platforms have maybe a draft. So that is the amount of um, platform that sits underneath the water. It might be between 30 feet um, approximately. Um, and that would work within the Humboldt Bay navigation channel. And the, you know, one of our subsequent webinars will discuss the navigation channel and how that works. Um, but these platform, this platform type or general platform type is suitable to this region, while the type of platform that was deployed off Scotland is actually an extremely long column rather than being a wide shallow platform. And the, the column type or what they call a spar buoy would not be appropriate for deployment in the Humboldt Bay region simply because our water is not deep enough um, directly next to the port. So the, uh, I guess to summarize, the turbines are identical and the platforms, there's many different technologies, some of which are suitable for Humboldt and the ones that are suitable for Humboldt have been demonstrated in, in, in Portugal. Thank you, Mark. Okay, we have a question for Nessie. Matthew has mentioned already established partnerships with Principal Power and others. Do you have any advice, non-monetary, for outside developers looking to secure a lease through Boehm's leasing process beyond, beyond those already mentioned? Um, as someone had mentioned, we are in a competitive leasing process, both on the North Coast and the Central Coast. So once we identify that there are um, potential areas for leasing, then we will hold an auction. And, um, you know, RCA and their partners would be um, free to um, bid in that auction and any others um, could bid as well. So nothing is set in stone yet. You can still participate but it is a, going to be a competitive auction. Thank you, Nessie. Um, a question for Mark and Arnie from Jamie. Do you agree with the statement by Walter Musel of the National Renewable Energy Lab, which he made at the August 5th webinar that, one, the North Coast project will go forward before the Central Coast proposal, Maybe I'll take it part by part. Let's just start with that question. The North Coast projects will go before the Central Coast proposal. Um, I, I don't know that we're best positioned to, to answer that. I mean, I, I, that here on the North Coast, I think that the big challenge is transmission and finding a, a way to address the transmission uh, interconnection issues. Um, on the central coast, it, it seems like the primary barrier is um, uh, military mission compatibility issues. Um, it's hard for me to say which of those two issues could be addressed more quickly. And I guess I will say that I'm, um, uh, uh, I mean, it, to me, it seems like it would be good if the military mission issues were, were able to be resolved. Um, uh, and it would, you know, it, if, if we're looking to develop on the North Coast, we'll have to be moving as quickly as we can to, to try and identify a solution for the, for the transmission issues as well as everything else. Um, um, Walt could be correct that the North Coast uh, will proceed more quickly, but uh, uh, what, what they always say is it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And so I, I think I'll leave that one in that category. 
Um, Thanks, Arnie. So the second part to that question is that the North Coast may not need to do a pilot project because the technological knowledge gained from the project being built off the coast of South Korea may negate the need for a local pilot project off the North Coast. Um, and I guess it depends on what is meant by a pilot project. Um, if a pilot project means putting one or two turbines out as a, uh, or, or maybe even three or four, um, it could be that that's uh, not necessary. Um, but it, I think it would be hard to imagine proceeding to a very large project without doing something at a, at a modest scale as, a, as an initial step. Um, and I guess I would welcome uh, comments from any of the other panelists or um, uh, state representatives on, on that point uh, as well, if anyone else wants to comment. Yeah, I guess I could just jump in and I think it sort of flows from the, the previous, um, you know, kind of question as well. And that I, I, I don't think that there needs to be a technological sort of pilot project because again, you know, th th these are going in in Europe and, and in other parts of the world. And certainly by the time anything is going to be going into the, the water off of California, you know, the, the technology will be, you know, proven, you know, at, at real world applications and, you know, to the, the conditions as far as, you know, um, Mark commented on the, the sort of technological parameters of those European projects, you know, and I think also to, to the questions about, you know, can, can this work in Humboldt County, you know, we've got rough challenging seas and I, and I think the, the evidence of that is, um, you know, Scotland isn't known for its pleasant climate and the North Sea is not, you know, friendly, um, you know, and, and so I think the fact that, you know, these projects are, are cutting their teeth in, in some pretty serious waters in Europe, um, you know, supports the, the work that we're going to try to do here um, in Northern California. Um, and, and so to, to that broader, you know, kind of picture, I, I, I do feel like we don't need to demonstrate the technology because that's already happening around the world. Um, you know, what's the pilot scale? You know, I think if you're looking at that kind of medium commercial scale pilot, you know, kind of demonstrating the commercial viability, not the technological viability, you know, that 100, 150 megawatt range, I think that's where, you know, the, the next step, um, you know, it is appropriately and it's a, you know, it's, it's a manageable size, you know, 10 turbines lets us learn a lot um, without kind of, you know, crossing the Rubicon into a giant project that might have, you know, unanticipated um, consequences or, or, or just, you know, be at a scale that, that you know, stakeholders aren't comfortable with. And so, you know, I, I, I agree with, with Arnie's, you know, it's, it's always an unwise move to predict the future, but I think, you know, a 100, 150 megawatt project in Humboldt, you know, is, is likely possible without, you know, major transmission upgrades. Um, and I could see that happening first with, you know, a second phase off the central coast where there aren't the transmission constraints um, you know, and, and then maybe a third phase, um, you know, if, if really the, the, the evidence is there after, you know, and, and the economics are there as well as the technology is there um, to, to scale up and, and warrant the transmission upgrades that would require, you know, future phases in Humboldt down the road. Uh, and just add what Matthew's saying, I, I think, um, I spoke about modeling and, you know, it's one thing to go from making modeling assumptions about the future portfolios of energy resources, but it is another thing to, to actually have investment occur. And um, so perhaps, perhaps um, international benchmarks are important, but I think also the East Coast experience, albeit with a different um, offshore wind technology, will be significant. And, you know, you know particularly um, with regard to how financiers um, price the risk. Um, there could be learnings there, um, which, you know, has a big effect on, on the economics um, on the West Coast. Fantastic. Thank you to all of you for that. So we have um, enough time for one more question. Um, this question is for Donna. As a local business leader, what information or research will be most helpful to your colleagues at this time? Are there concerns or interests from the business community that aren't yet being addressed? Um, having gone through uh, the process and learning with the um, onshore wind project, 
we found that working with the Sharps Institute, um, the RCEA, uh, and going to the different seminars has proven invaluable to our business community. We did an article in last year's membership magazine, so about 12 months this time, uh, showing the importance of meeting the criteria of the state in relation to renewable energy. We wanted to be part of that solution. Um, of course, we're concerned for our fishermen and environment, uh, but we trust that the discussions going forward will meet all of those questions and we certainly want to be part of that and we feel very much a part of it. So we feel comfortable with uh, the process that's, uh, that are going on right now and, uh, and going on through the future. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Donna. Um, it seems like there's one question that I can't help but ask. It seems like a good closing question. Um, so could the College of the Redwoods play a role in training and education regarding wind turbine design, training, building, and maintenance? And could commercial fishing people be trained up to troubleshoot and or service turbines at sea? Could the skilled labor need to be shared with the local construction community and workforce development so that we can prepare our local workforce to fill those jobs? So I realize it's a lengthy question, but it seems like a good one to end on, just asking about building capacity locally. So Arnie, perhaps you wanna address that? Um, I can at least start, which is to say that I think it should be a priority for our region to do what we can to build that capacity. I can imagine uh, the College of the Redwoods playing a role in that. I can imagine HSU playing a role in that. Um, uh, and um, I, I also think that, um, as we look at, um, you know, if, if uh, a commercial project does go forward, it seems like conversations or discussions with the developers should include discussions about um, how they will support that uh, capacity building and what their commitments will be to, to um, working with the community to, to ensure that as many of the jobs as practical are, are developed here locally. Um, and um, I guess, uh, I would imagine that uh, there are a number of um, um, uh, tasks or or operations related activities where um, the skill set of people in the fishing community uh, could be quite valuable. Um, in the third webinar on September 28th, one of the panelists will be from uh, Principal Power, which is a, a floating platform um, uh, 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 deployment company. And I think uh, it could be quite interesting to ask that question um, of them to, to get a sense of, of what sorts of, um, of skills are, would they be looking for if they were to, to deploy this technology and how would that relate to uh, the, the types of skills that could be present here in the region. Um, so these, you know, we've had a fantastic set of questions and I think that some of the uh, today, and I think we've answered them to some degree, but I think I would be very personally very interested to hear responses from to some of these same questions in some of the future sessions, uh, because we'll have uh, an additional set of panelists who can bring additional insight to, to these questions. So for those of you who ask some of these questions, please bring them back again, because I think um, uh, we can answer them to, to a certain degree, but I think that there's, there's additional perspectives that can be brought to bear on, on some of these questions. In subsequent sessions. Thank you, Arnie, and thanks for yeah making that comment about how this this is just the start of the discussion, right? So we want to continue to bring all of the questions asked today and those that we haven't heard yet into subsequent discussions and really continue to have a dialogue. So thank you to everyone for the fantastic questions and thanks to our speakers, our remarkers, our panelists. Um, for helping to provide additional context and information. I thought that went really, really well. And um, I do want to acknowledge that with over 200 participants, you know, we made a valiant effort to address as many questions as possible. We didn't get through them all. Um, and as we've stated before, the SHOT Center does look forward to continuing to take those questions in, consider them, and then develop a um, FAQ document that will be ma made available at the end of the webinar series. So at this point in time, um, just going to share my screen. We would like to begin to wrap up. Um, 
and share information about next steps for the North Coast Offshore Wind Feasibility Studies and details on next week's webinar. And we'd also love to have um, the opportunity to hear from you all about your experience during today's webinar so that we can make any necessary amendments to the remaining webinars in order to, bring, to build a stronger community discussion. So you will see a link um, on the slide and it will also be dropped into the chat and the Q&A. We invite you to click on the link and complete the survey. You can feel free to do so right now as I'm wrapping up. Um, and you, the survey will also be emailed out following today's webinar, so you can continue to fill it out at your own time. Um, I should say that the survey is anonymous, so there's no concerns about sharing your true feedback. Um, we are not collecting any personal data. And the responses and results may be included in a survey um, that will be developed that summarizes the webinar series um, the key discussion highlights, the presentation highlights, and the perspectives that we heard from. And that webinar summary series will be made, like everything else, available to the public on the SHOT Center website. We will talk about that more in a moment. Um, so again, invite you to click on the link now and complete that. Um, the Google form will be emailed, as I mentioned, and we will be requesting your feedback by Friday, September 18th. So by this Friday, gives you a couple of days. For those that are participating on the phone via listen only, you're invited to provide your feedback via email and continue to submit questions um, regarding this first webinar up until the same date, Friday. And these questions will again be considered as part of the FAQ document. So today's webinar, as we've mentioned, was the first in a series of five, and we certainly do hope that you'll join us for the rest of the webinars. Um, each each session will be very similar to today's um, webinar. It'll include a presentation of research results, a panel discussion, and then a community discussion with the participants. The webinars will provide information about energy transmission and trans energy generation and transmission. Check, that's today. Local economic and job development, we also spoke about that today. Port and coastal infrastructure, ecological and geological environmental considerations, and community perspectives on regional impacts and opportunities. Please note that the final webinar is indicated as a TBD. Um, we're trying to figure out the best date. We did become aware of October 12th being Columbus Day and a federal holiday, and we wanna to try to maximize inclusion for our entire community members. And so we will share information as soon as possible in the coming weeks um, for what that new date will be for the fifth and final um, webinar. Okay, so next steps from today's webinar, um, the presentations and the webinar recording will be posted on the Shop Center website. There's the website link there. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with the website. You went there to register for um, today's webinar. As I've mentioned a couple of times, a meeting summary will be developed that highlights the key themes from the webinar series. So it won't be a transcript. It'll be taking a higher level approach to really capture the, the key themes, the, the major discussion points and perspectives that were shared. Questions, comments, perspectives, poll and survey results will all be anonymous in the summary. And the summary will be shared with um, the Ocean Protection Council along with the final research reports that are made available to the public. And I am aware that some of those reports have been shared um, publicly on the SHOTS website as of um, this morning, a couple of hours before our webinar began. So I welcome you to take a look and read through those um, as you have time and interest. The final offshore wind studies research report and the FAQ will be made available on the SHOT Center website again in the coming weeks um, following the closure of our seminar series, if not beforehand. Okay, so the next webinar is Exploring the Feasibility of Offshore Wind Energy for the California North Coast ecological and geological environment. So this is next Monday, two o'clock to four o'clock. You'll note that it's a uh, one hour shorter. And please do remember to register at shotcenter.org slash wind. Um, and it'll be the same procedure to get on. You'll be provided with a, with a personal Zoom link and also call in information if you're unable to um, join us virtually online. I also wanted to mention that you can feel free to email windstudies at shotcenter.org to receive updates 
uh, with respect to both the webinar series, but also I'm under the impression um, the offshore wind studies and research themselves. So feel free to email that and you'll be placed onto their listserv. We wanted to share information for an upcoming webinar that may be of interest. So this is outside of the SHOTS research, uh, you know, the SHOTS Center webinars that we're a part of today. This is a webinar that's hosted by the Ocean Protection Council and the California Energy Commission. And they're looking to discuss recent activities related to offshore wind energy planning for the Central Coast. And so you'll see online, they're looking to schedule um, this webinar for Wednesday, September 23rd, or Thursday, September 24th at 4 o'clock. Um, the notice of availability is linked here, so feel free to click on that and visit. And if you have any questions or if you would like to RSVP, um, you can contact Chris Potter and Eli Harland, and both of their emails are shown um, on the slide. And so we recognize that you know, we're doing our best to also make you aware of other events that, that may be of interest to you, but want to make sure that our series is um, that you understand that those are distinct. So this series is really focused on exclusively California's North Coast. And this webinar that I just mentioned is talking about the Central Coast. And there's also BOEM webinars and other webinars that are happening in parallel related to offshore wind. Sarah, I just want to note a comment that came in from the audience. Um, it's saying that it's, those dates are actually going to be either September 23rd or September 25th. Fantastic. Thank you for that notice. And we will um, update that before the final slides are submitted in case folks refer back. Thank you. Okay, so I am thrilled that we are on time. Um, to conclude. So thank you again, everyone, for taking the time to be here. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. We hope you've learned a lot. And for more information about the webinar series or any of the wind energy studies, again, please visit the Shop Center's website and feel free to email windstudies.shopcenter.org if you have any questions or you wish to join the email listserv and receive those email updates. Thank you so much for a fantastic webinar. We really hope that you'll join us next week or one of the future weeks. Um, have a wonderful evening. Stay safe and good night. Thank you.